All right, uh, welcome everyone to the March 29th meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. This open meeting of the Redevelopment Board is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020, due to the state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. For this meeting, the redevelopment board is convening via Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating via video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other people may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. I will now take a roll call to confirm that all members of the redevelopment board are present and can hear me, starting with Kim Lau. Uh, present. David Watson. Present. Jean Benson. Present. And Melissa Tintakalis. All right, I will ask her to uh, recognize herself when she arrives. And I am Rachel Zemberry, Chair of the Redevelopment Board. We also have three staff present, I believe. Um, or maybe it's just the two of us right now, but there will be a third joining. Great. Jenny and Aaron, would you introduce yourselves, please? I'm Jenny Raid. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development. And I'm Aaron Zwerko, Assistant Director of Planning and Community Development. And uh, Kelly Linema is with us. Hello, Kelly Linema, Senior Planner, Department of Planning and Community Development. Great, thank you so much. So with that, um, we will move to the first item of our agenda and we will now reopen the continued public hearing for the warrant articles related to the zoning bylaws for spring town meeting. This is the third of four nights of hearings as published in the schedule on Nova's agenda for a total of 22 warrant articles. Consistent with the past, the Redevelopment Board will be hearing from the article applicants and public wishing to speak on each of these articles as scheduled. Applicants will have three minutes to address the board. The board will then pose any questions to the applicants, followed by a period for open public comment. Note that the board will reserve final discussion and voting on each article until the very last night of hearings on April 5th. So before we begin, let me run through the procedures for any person who wishes to speak at tonight's public hearing. So the scope of the public hearing is the subject matter as posted in the agenda. Any person wishing to address the redevelopment board on the subject matter of the agenda item shall signify their desire to speak by raising their hand when the chair announces consideration of each item. To raise your hand and zoom on your computer, go to the participants section and select raise hand or on your phone, press star six to unmute yourself. After being recognized to speak by the chair, each person will preface their comments by giving their first and last name and their street address. And I will remind you at the end uh, of the discussion before each public comment period. Each person addressing the board on the subject matter of the agenda item shall list shall limit their remarks to three minutes. If time allows, you will may be allowed to speak more than once at the discretion from the chair if you have a new and different point to make or question to ask on the topic. The board may receive any oral or written evidence, but such evidence is restricted to the subject matter of the agenda item. Immaterial or unduly repetitious evidence may be excluded. Everyone present at the public hearing is requested not to applaud or otherwise express approval or disapproval of any statements made or action taken at each hearing. Hearing participants shall refrain from interrupting other speakers and conduct themselves in a civil and courteous manner. Speakers should address any questions through the chair. Speakers shall not attempt to engage in debate or dialogue with the redevelopment board, other hearing participants, or the public at large. Questions may or may not be answered during this public hearing. And with that, it looks like uh, Melissa has joined us. Welcome, Melissa. And we will move to the first item on our agenda this evening, which is uh, Article 47, a zoning bylaw amendment establishing requirements for off-street uh, handicap par placard parking. 
And this is inserted by the select board at, by the request of the Disability Commission. So do we have a representative from either the Disability yes. or the select board? Yes. Yeah, sorry. Thank you very much. So if you would like to introduce yourself and uh, please speak, you will have uh, three minutes to address the board. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, my name is Darcy Devney, Thorndike Street, Arlington. I am the chair of the Arlington Commission on Disabilities. <coughs> um, I did send some stuff in advance, but just in case everybody attending this hasn't been able to read some of it, I'm just gonna say, why are we doing this Warren article in the first place is because in 2016, the zoning bylaw 6.1.5 was changed to allow the ARB to permit reductions of up to 75% in the required number of off street parking spaces for developments in certain districts. And then in 2019, that was, uh, we added R7. And then just a few months ago, we said it could go down to zero in the B3 and B5 districts. So legally, the ARB cannot waive compliance with ADA accessibility requirements because the ADA is a federal civil rights legislation. Inadvertently, however, these 6.1.5 waivers do reduce the required number of off-street HP spaces because the ADA and the MAB regulations base the minimum number of required off-street HP spaces on the total number of parking spaces. So I think you have the, hmm, the printout from the, the a ARB that has the little blue symbol and has what they are normally for ADA and MAAB. Yep, that one, thank you. Um, and sorry, I just lost my screen. How did that happen? Ah, here we go. Okay. Um, so in essence, the rationale for allowing these reductions in the parking minimums as they currently exist in the bylaws is that a TDM, a transportation demand management plan will be implemented. But if you look at those TDM methods that are available, sorry, it, um, it's clear that many of them are they're burdensome or they're impossible for many people with disabilities to take advantage of. Um, it's not that people with disabilities don't ride bicycles, but for example, bicycle racks just aren't much use for wheelchair users. Um, so when we looked at this, um, we tried to come up with a way to sort of fix this. And the easiest, simplest thing to do that we probably should have had done at the time that this was coming before town meeting is um, fixing it by saying, okay, since it's normally this many spaces, why don't we do the HP spaces as if there hadn't been a parking reduction at all? So I sent you a chart of what that would look like. Can you pop that up please? with some examples. Um, it's a chart that has a yellow uh, bar on the right-hand side. Yep, that one, okay. Um, and you can see, we tried to do a couple of examples just to show you the kinds of things that are happening with it. Now you can see that really, it's not a huge loss in HP spaces, it's just that given the number of HP spaces you're going to have, it's a big percentage of them. So it's just that it inadvertently effectively overrides the ADA and the MAB standards because when you change the, all, the total of regular parking spaces, you change the number of HP spaces just by default. Um, so we're trying to correct that with this suggested amendment D. Um, and I think if you have any questions, it's it's pretty straightforward, I believe, but there are probably questions. So uh, yeah. thanks. Thank you. I appreciate it. We will uh, now run through the uh, board members to see what questions you have for uh, the uh, about this uh, proposed Warren article. And we'll start with Jean. Thank you. And thank you for presenting this article. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is, 
one of the things that um, the ARB can do is to say that no parking spaces are required. And we would do that when there is no existing parking. And it did come up in one instance in the past year or two, in which case um, we said, gee, we need something that gives us the ability to go to zero for a, a business that wanted to move in to a location that had no parking spaces and they couldn't create any parking spaces. So what you're doing, I think makes sense, but it doesn't work when it goes from some number to zero because there's nowhere to put the handicapped parking space if there's no parking available. So do you have any suggestions how we might deal with that? Okay, do I go ahead or? Yeah. Please, please, if you could answer the question. Thank you. So um, okay, so if there are, if there's any um, parking at all, right, at least one of them must be accessible. Um, although valet only parking does not trigger an ADA violation, it's an unfriendly policy. I think we just, we went through this at another meeting like a couple of months ago to try to describe um, valet coverage just isn't good enough. It doesn't provide permanent, reliable 24 seven coverage. And further, as we've noted, <laughs> valet parking cannot safely handle specially modified vehicles, depending on what kind of disability you have. So the answer is if it's, if there's even one parking space, it should be an accessible space. If there's no parking at all, then um, I would think that we would handle that the way we've handled on street parking in Arlington where we take a look, we take requests, we go out and look at the space and see what's nearby um, and how likely it is that that business or, or resident will attract um, that kind of thing. Like in the ADA, um, medical buildings, for example, have a much higher percentage of handicapped spaces because it's considered that you would probably need more of them. Um, so you really, if it's zero, it's zero. And we're kind of stuck with that. That's not something you can do very much about. So uh, when I talked to the town council, he said that there might be a way to just put something in there that says, if you have reduced it to zero, you've reduced it to zero. Um, and then we would just handle, the Commission on Disabilities would handle the sort of on street parking space that we would need to add quite probably at that point. But that would be an on street public space. So that would be a little different and it wouldn't go through the ARB. So, I mean, that makes sense to me. So I'm, I'm wondering if you would accept, if we were to do this, just a friendly amendment to this to indicate that if the required number of parking spaces is zero, then there wouldn't be any HP parking spaces. Um, yes, because you were that, right. as you point out, that makes sense. Right. We would have, that, we would handle it, but we would handle it separately. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense to me too. The other question um, I had was, there have been some times when we've reduced the number of spaces because it's an existing building that just needs a special permit for something new in the existing number of spaces is, are quite a bit smaller, quite a bit fewer than there were before. So I think in, in any event, the ones I'm thinking of that end up being one HP space, but if there were one, if there were event where there would otherwise require to be more, should there be more even if there were never that many spaces to trigger more than one space? Um, sadly, when I look at the stats for this kind of thing, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. it, it's true that uh, people, people always associate the ADA and mobility and HP spaces with wheelchair only, and that's not actually the biggest percentage of uh, people with disabilities, but there's all sorts of reasons why you might need an HP parking space, you know, fatigue if you're going through chemotherapy, um, some of the people with autism can't really do a group sort of carpool. So they need to 
be taken singly in a vehicle, that kind of thing. So yeah, I would add in the graying of America, not that being old means that you're disabled, but there is some correlation. And we've got to, Massachusetts has a silver tsunami coming. So I have a feeling it's just going to get more. We need to be more inclusive, we really do. Yes, I think I'm at the leading edge of that silver tsunami. <laughs> Yes, I know about that. Yeah. Um, okay, I think um, yeah, I think I'll I'll just stop there for the moment. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Jean, and thank you for the clarification, Darcy. Uh, Ken, any questions? Yeah. Hi, Darcy. Um, follow up on, on the line what uh, Jean was following up on. Um, where there is uh, existing non-conforming uh, parking spaces in in a lot there. And so you're saying we should make one of those existing ones uh, handicap accessible. Yes. And by doing that, uh, by the ADA, if you have one handicap space, that would have to be a van handicap parking space because that's what the law says it so. would the big difference there is the access aisle um uh and you'd have to do that anyway so you wouldn't be taking any more space than you would take for a regular one um the only time it would come into the only time it would be different for a van is um for things that have height height requirements there is a height requirement for a van space that's different from a non-van space but other than that, you're going to need the access aisle anyway. So it's, I think it's eight feet plus five feet for an access aisle. I believe it is eight, eight, eight foot for the parking space and eight foot for the access space adjacent to it. And for, for, a, van, for a van height, it's, it's eight foot four inches clear. Okay, and if you could pop up the the, well, I don't want to get into too much details. I want to stay in this okay. uh, so at this higher level here. Um, but let's say there is no room to get the the the, the van height in the existing non-conforming space. Uh, uh, I mean, is, are we gonna, can we word it in such a way where uh, it, it, it's a little, has a little more slack into it? I, I I truly really feel that yeah, we do need handicap accessible spaces, but in certain areas, if you don't, if you can't have it, you can't have it. Uh, and I don't want to be so uh, blunt with this with this uh, amendment where it precludes anybody from doing anything because they don't have the space. That's the only thing I'm, I'm a little worried about. And I just want to, if we can, like Jean said, mm -hmm. be word is a little friendlier, where it 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 gives some exceptions. I'm not saying you know it's a it's a broad exception, but say if there's no height, you just say you know there's parking below, but there's no way you're going to get eight foot four, eight foot five clear. It is what it is. I, so, so we we get the exception that the van uh, park space is not it would be required. You, you following me there, or am I not being clear enough? No, I am following you, and you are right. It's the eight feet wide. I always forget that one. Um, in that case, honestly, what I would say is that the developer needs to ask the MAAB, the Massachusetts Architectural Access Board, for a waiver, which is which is a, a thing that happens anyway. Do you know what I mean? There's already a process, a procedure set up for that. But it, when you do that, part of what the developer or owner has to um, talk about is why exactly is it impossible or too much of a burden um, to put in that space. But yes, it, it recognizes that there are unique spaces. But I, I would think, yeah, if they went through, they do a waiver process. And then you request and you, you go through a hearing and you put, it's, it's a lot like an ARB thing actually, um, in that you, you ask and you, you talk about the unique properties of that particular site. And that is normally why someone asks for. So would you be amenable to add some sort of verbiage into this saying that when uh, when it can't be done, 
that uh, a waiver process would have, would have to start with, uh, with with the handicap commission or something like that, so um, that at least at least so it makes it clear mm -hmm. uh, for someone who's trying to do the right thing how to go about doing it. I would be perfectly happy to say yes, you know, to word it however the town council thinks or you think it should be worded, um, to say that they would have to apply for a waiver from the Massachusetts Architectural Access Board. I wouldn't actually like them to apply directly to us because that's not something we can grant. Um, it has to be through, it has to be- board, Yes, I understand that. Okay, so no, yeah. however that wording should go then. I'm not the greatest at wording. I think maybe Jean or uh, uh, might be a, a better person for wording, uh, you know. Uh, I, think, I think we can do that, uh, both of those. You know, the zero one and uh, unless they get a waiver from the MAAB. Okay. Yeah. And then my last question is, um, I know this parking reduction is, is not new to, um, uh, to, to many towns similar to ours. Are any other towns um, adopted this, uh, added on, um, the, and how, how successful or unsuccessful it has been? I think that um, the uh, Arlington's um, planning and development uh, talked about it in their comments on this article. Um, and there have only been two, but honestly, I would like us to, I would like us to be a role model for this because it is so, an issue that comes up. We belong to something called, um, I go to the meetings of the CODA, which is the Commission on Disabilities Alliance, which is um, local commission of disabilities, Commission on Disabilities chairs. Um, and this is one of the issues that keeps coming up. So I think it hasn't gotten, it hasn't bubbled to the level of um, trying to get a state law passed, but it is something where towns where parking is, you know, a difficult process and these reductions are getting, are getting um, permitted more and more that we should start doing it. And I'm hoping that, that I will, you know, share this with my colleagues and they will probably start the same sort of thing in their town if they're having these kind of issues. Uh, uh, Rachel, I'm all set with my questions. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. Did you want um, either Aaron or Jenny to comment based on um, what was in the memo? I know the question was about some of the research that they have um, completed about what, what they're finding in other towns or are you Sure. Yeah, that'd be nice too. Yes. Thank you, uh, Rachel. Aaron, do you want to speak to the memo? Do you want me to bring it up? Uh, no, I, I don't think you need to bring it up. Um, so uh, in support um, of the memo that we put together, uh, I looked at um, the comparable communities that are often referred to by the town manager. So that includes quite a number of um, our neighboring communities, communities in Metro West and just on the North Shore. Um, and in those uh, zoning bylaws or zoning ordinances, I did find an example in Cambridge and in Needham where um, reductions are allowed through a special permit, which is very similar to how it uh, works in Arlington. Um, but there is a clarification that the reduction is um, not applicable to the required number of um, HP parking spaces that are otherwise required by the MAAB regulations. Um, so those were the two examples that I found. Um, there might be others, um, but to uh, control the amount of research that I was doing, I used um, the examples that are often cited in town documents. Great. Thank you, Erin. Can anything else? Uh, no, but that's Great. concrete for now. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, David Watson. Uh, so thank you very much for bringing this up. Uh, I, uh, I I think it is uh, very necessary for us to pay more attention uh, to this when we're looking at parking reductions. Um, I did have a little bit of follow-up to the previous comments and, and maybe one or two additional questions. Uh, the first was with, with respect to the amendment that uh, Jean Benson brought up uh, where, the, where the number of required spaces is zero. I think when, when we draft new language, uh, 
for that exception that it be very clear that that number is zero after any permitted reductions, uh, not, not that it's uh, zero to begin with. Um, because that, that would have almost no effect uh, potentially if, if we word it that way. Um, with respect to uh, the MAAB waiver process, it seems to me that for us to ensure um, that, uh, that we are looking out for the right number of spaces in a, in a project that um, if any waiver is going to be requested, it must be sought and, and uh, received uh, prior to us being able to permit a project or else make it conditional on the receipt of, of such a waiver. And I, I don't know whether there's anything uh, further that needs to be said um, uh, in, in the draft proposal um, or if that's just a process issue for, for the ARB and the planning department to deal with. I don't Rachel, know, I can, yeah, I can, sure. Rachel, please, Jenny, yep, sure. yeah, I, I was thinking about that, actually, and I, I would suggest that it doesn't belong in the zoning bylaw, because that's how we handle other similar, you know, boards or commissions, we don't note that they need to, there's a process, we, we don't talk really about process in the bylaw anymore, um, but I would say that maybe in our rules and regulations, when we talk about EDR, we probably would amend that to talk about, you know, sort of procedurally when you're dealing with other approvals um, in relationship to your permit um, and the process that you'd go through to get those other approvals. Um, that would be my suggestion. For example, we deal with the Historical Commission quite often. We frequently say it's, you know, conditioned upon getting, a, you know, the approval of, um, or, or a certificate, depending upon which it is, um, from that commission um, as part of a specific condition in the special permit. So I would suggest we handle it in a similar way. That makes sense to me. Um, um, so I had a couple of thoughts on maybe edge cases where I'm not quite sure what should happen. Um, so in a situation where we've got uh, an existing building with X number of parking spaces um, that comes back before the ARB um, for a new special permit or a permit modification. Um, what happens if they uh, have no accessible spaces, but their existing spaces are fully utilized by, by existing residents? Um, and if, if we were then to require them to turn one of those into an accessible space, then wouldn't that end up displacing um, parking of one of the existing residents? Um, and that, that seems like a problematic case to me. Um, another one, which is a little bit similar is uh, if, if you've got a building that itself is not ADA accessible and isn't required to be, um, and, uh, and it's resident only parking, uh, and there are no disabled residents, then you may end up with requiring a parking space uh, that can't be used by guests. It will never, can't be used by residents uh, and we'll just, it's just taking up space and it's just paved space. And that, that doesn't seem like an optimal outcome either. So I, I wanted to see if the proponent had any thoughts on those cases. David, would you like to respond to that, Darcy? Uh, yes, that is a, a very good question. We did think about this kind of thing. Um, there, there's two things I would say, and one of them is, when you are redeveloping a building, you don't say, okay, well, it doesn't have to come up to current electrical standards, because it does. So part of me wants to say, it's part of being a modern building that you have to do your best. 
now I understand that your best isn't can't always be that is why they have the variances can't always be that but that it, it strikes me as sort of it's discounting why we do it really because the idea is to make it accessible to as many people as possible and as we discussed when you say a building isn't accessible people with disabilities it's such a wide range and such a why it may or may not be accessible in one way or another that um there are plenty of people who can use an hp placard that can walk upstairs for example um, and the reverse, there are plenty of people who have to have an HP placard and can't do any stairs at all, not even a little step. So I would think, you know, if nothing else, if visitors get to use spaces, are we saying that people with certain kinds of disabilities can't have access to the visitor spaces, can't, can't visit their friends? That seems a little... Do you know what I mean? Because part of this is if you remove the barrier, you remove the barrier um, at the beginning. You don't make everybody request everything all the time because that's that's putting a burden on them to have someone else yeah. do that. And as I said in my notes, it, it can take a very long time with the MAAB and the ADA because it's a very um, adversarial process. Yeah. So there can be a lot of foot dragging well, I, I completely understand. I, I think the reality is that we deal with um, a lot of um, of small projects um, that have very few parking spaces to begin with, either either, uh, either retro uh, fits or or new construction, or um, uh, projects that have extremely constrained space for parking. Um, so it's not, all, it's not, uh, it's often not as easy as just saying you must include a handicap space um, because it's, it, it can be, as, as Ken was saying, just not, not physically possible um, in, in the given conditions. And you know, I, I think aspirationally, I completely agree with you. Uh, we want to, we always want to try to address this and address it up front um, rather than make it something that people have to request. But um, just the, given the reality of many of the projects we deal with, it, I, I feel like somehow there needs to be the ability for for the ARB to exercise discretion um, to, uh, to some extent. Do you have a specific um, question or did you just wanna put that point out there? Well, I mean, I think the, the problem is right now, this, this eliminates the ARB's discretion. Um, and um, it, no matter what the size of the project is or what the space constraints are. And I, I don't see how that's going to be workable in 100% of, of uh, the projects that come before us. So that's, that's my point. Okay. Thank you, David. Uh, Ken. Um, to follow up a little bit on what David was saying, I, I totally agree with him. Uh, maybe we can um, leave it leave it a little loose what I said before, like I said before, where let's say um, there's five assigned um, spaces. This is an example of five assigned spaces for um, apartment buildings. And, uh, right, and right now there is no requirement for it. Uh, there's no, no one living there that's handicapped and needs, who has a, a placard that says they need handicapped space. But we have one that's designated for one. Once one uh, is seen that it's required, then that space would go to the handicapped placard user. But if one is not uh, used, then we're not building a simple space for us just to build a space. So it, 
So it, it, it might, might work better within that and, and maybe leave that some discretion for us to say, um, you know, if, if a handicap space is needed, then this is the space for it and it has all the requirements to meet that uh, handicap space you know, access with the access, the heights and so forth. But when there's not one required, then um, th that would just be assigned to one of the apartment buildings until one is until one is deemed needed. And then th that would revert that way or something like along those lines. Could that something be worded in such a way, David? Or uh, I'm not sure about well, the wording. Well, I, I think it's it's maybe easier to do that in a rental situation, but if you're in, in say a condo situation and it's, the spaces are deeded, it it's not so easy to suddenly tell a resident, you know, that the new the new handicapped resident has to have your space and you have to move your car over to this other space that they can't use. Well, I'm not I, sure I, how that would work. I understand that there. Just just. But then you're forcing someone to build a designated handicap space that may never that may never be used. And well, yeah, that that yeah, I, I understand that that was one of my concerns. Um, so, but maybe maybe and and in some cases, with very constrained space, uh, that that is a that's going to be a big deal to build a parking space that may never be used. Um, but maybe we, I mean, it sounds like in many cases where it is possible uh, that, that they do have to do that. Um, you know, I think what my concern is in, in those uh, cases around the edges where uh, you're dealing with a very small number of spaces or very constrained space, and it just really isn't possible, how do we... Um, maintain the discretion to um, allow that to happen or okay. can we so david you're you're looking for a carve out for existing spaces for uh, existing properties with constrained sites so that the proponent does not need to go to the maab which is a very long process and there there is a process established but it's um, again for a small lot um, small property, it, it can be a challenging process to go through. Yeah. So you're looking for an opportunity within this bylaw change for the redevelopment board to exercise discretion specifically for constrained sites with existing parking, correct? Uh, especially where that parking is fully utilized by, by current residents. Um, because then you'd be displacing a resident from their parking space in order to create a handicap space. So I think that that point is is noted. Um, I'd I'd like to get to um, Melissa and and her mm -hmm. comments, um, and then perhaps we uh, take public comment. And then Darcy, if if it's okay with you, what I'd like to do is then circle back at the end with um, the request that that Jean had made, as well as David's request, and and just talk about what what. Um, might be feasible and what you what you might be willing to to take a look at between now and 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 when the final um piece goes through if that works for you sure okay super thank you uh, melissa any any comments or questions um yeah i guess this might be for um, jenny or aaron in terms of parking you know my experience has been, you know, looking at parking supply and management of the whole um, and trying not to make um, kind of small ad hoc tweaks, whether it's on street or off. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, given the, I guess, on street analysis that was done before the parking meters went in, was there any analysis done to the off street and um, consideration, not just to handicap, but to um, the parking kind of, as it relates to both the demand? I can just speak to the accessible parking, actually. That was conducted by the Disability Commission. And I wanna say that was three years ago, maybe four now, Darcy. I believe it was 2016. It was the same town meeting where the reductions were done. So with that one, um, what ended up happening was the installation of additional 
accessible parking spaces throughout mostly Mass Ave and maybe other places in town. I'm, I'm trying to remember, but, but it came out of a study and it led to a warrant article being developed. And then I believe it led to the installation of additional spaces. Is that an accurate sort of replay of it? Yes. Okay. So that was that was the study that we conducted. We have we have done other demand analyses, but more you know in concentrated areas along Mass Ave corridor, Broadway, but not all over <laughs> town necessarily. But more in relationship to uh, business districts. Um, so we have looked at that. Okay. Um... I think at this point, I don't have any further questions. I'm just kind of absorbing everything at this point. So thanks. Great. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, before I open it up for public comments, uh, are there any other uh, questions from, from the board for either Darcy or uh, Jenny or Aaron? And you'll have to speak up because I can't- Jean has his hand up, yeah. Jean. Thank you. Um, yeah, David and, and Ken got me thinking about um, this, and I, I, I think actually the, the scenario David and Kim mentioned, I don't think would end up being a problem because for X number of spaces, I've forgotten, certainly Darcy knows the number is just going to be one HP space. So once the lot is big enough to require more than that, there's probably going to be enough spaces to put one in. I'm more thinking about the situation where let's say there's a very small building that's all residential. And let's say there are five units and each unit is assigned a space. Um, so there's no necessar necessarily a designation of which one is the handicapped space because each unit is assigned a space, is that a problem, Darcy? Um, uh, Rachel, did you want me to talk about it now or at the end of public comment? In why, case? Why, don't, why don't you go ahead and answer Jean's, Jean's question now. And then Jean, um, after Darcy answers, let's table this and let's, let's yeah. take public comments and then we'll circle back around. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, and it, what you started by saying is, is true that basically if there's Mm, it's one through 14, one through 15 spaces in a lot, one of them must be accessible. So if there's one space, it has, one, it has to be accessible. If there's 15, one of them has to be accessible. And you are correct that anything over that is, is kind of more what we're talking about. Um, but I, I didn't kind of understand the second part of that. Uh, the second part is, let's say there's a small building with, let's say, four residential units. Mm -hmm. And each, and usually it would be entitled, I'm making this up, I'm not sure. Let's say it would be entitled, required to have six spaces, but there's no place to fit in six spaces. So the, the solution is four spaces, one space assigned to each residential unit. So in, in the scenario, it would otherwise require one of the four spaces to be handicapped accessible, but there's only one space and it's specifically designated for each unit. So I'm just wondering how you would handle that situation. That is a good question. And I think I have to go back to the, uh, we have someone actually on the uh, Disability Commission at the moment, um, who had a very long struggle to get her condo association to put in um, a space for her. And she shouldn't have had to do that because that means that she could only look at ones that already had spaces or she could look forward to a long argument about it. And either way, again, you're kind of putting the onus on her to to make them be modern enough to be not automatically disqualifying people with HP placards from being in their building. Well, except she would be entitled, in the scenario I posited, she or he would be entitled to one space. 
Yes, but I think what Ken was talking about is that one space has to be bigger than okay. most spaces. So in fact, you would sometimes be taking sort of a space and a half away. Um, and I can see a landlord just digging in their heels on that. Got and that, okay. that's what worries me. Okay, thanks. I'm gonna think about it some more. Okay. Jean, just to, just to follow up on that, please, Rachel. We just had, we had a project we, recently. We do need to move to public comment. Sorry, Rachel. If, if you could just make it brief, let's, let's wrap this yeah. up. I mean, we did see a project really recently, 400 Mass Ave, that had a very small number of spaces, all fully utilized and in very constrained space where they can't possibly put a handicapped space without displacing a current parking space. So we've seen that already. Um, and then in a deeded parking space situation with like one deeded space per unit, the only way to ensure compliance, I think, would be to make all of the spaces a, uh, compliant. So I, I think this one, again, I'd, I'd like to take public comment and then if we could circle back so that we could um, discuss a little further and make any recommendations that we might have to Darcy about um, any modifications we would like her to consider um, prior to next Monday. So with that, I will uh, now open uh, this up for public comment. Any member of the public wishing to speak in reference to uh, Article 47, if you could please use the raise hand function in the uh, participant section of Zoom, I will call on you in the order that the hands are raised. Um, please remember to state your first and last name and address for the record. And we will start with James Fleming. Awesome, am I audible? You are, thank you. You'll have right, to uh, Thank you. Uh, cool, cool. Uh, James Fleming, 58 Oxford Street. I'm torn on this article because the ideal world is that there's no need to ensure that there's a number of handicapped spaces because the entire built environment is handicap accessible. Unfortunately, that isn't the world we live in. So I'm, I'm in favor of this because it's a, I, as much as parking annoys me personally, uh, I think that there's a, there's a, it's a reasonable measure to say, if we are going to start reducing spaces and still have a built environment that isn't fully accessible, that you you have a separate set of conditions that say this is how many handicapped spaces are accessible in town, because the ADA minimums are at a set at a national level and are are pretty low bar, as I understand it, for a number of accessible spaces. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, the next speaker will be Don Seltzer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Uh, I think I might have a solution to the question that was raised by several board members about deeded or assigned spots in a small lot. Uh, the simple answer is paint. Just redraw the lines as the tenancy changes. And uh, I don't think in most deeded um, situations, they specify geographically where the deeded space is, so you could always just repaint the slot numbers um, to accommodate whoever is living in the building at that time. Uh, maybe it's simplistic, but I think it will probably handle some of those problems that you raised. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Carl Wagner. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, I, I wanted, I'm Carl Wagner, 30 Edge Hill Road in Arlington. Um, Arlington Residents for Responsible Redevelopment sent out a comment on this to people in Arlington because I think it's important to understand that our zoning bylaw specifies a minimum number of off street spaces that are required for new developments in our business districts. And federal and state ADA requirements are, relate, are regulating also how those uh, spaces uh, should be accessible to holders of these HP placards. But then five years ago, we, and I think I in town meeting, gave the ARB 
wide latitude to reduce the parking requirements to up to 75% reductions. The, the frustrating thing here is we did not in, expect this to happen. It was an unintended consequence. And I hope the ARB and also the planning department realize that what the uh, Council on Disabilities, the Commission on Disabilities is doing here is helping to correct a mistake that was an unintended consequence. I think if, if you don't see that the town is asking the town to fix something and, and you don't work with them to make this happen, it, it's frustrating to town meeting members who did not intend this. And we would have to seriously look at removing this 75% reduction for parking spaces that was given to the ARB in its entirety. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'll just remind everyone that's what we're working on right now is finding a, a way that we can uh, come to a, a come to a way to move this forward uh, with understanding what these edge conditions, uh, what happens to the, to the parking in these edge conditions. Uh, any other speakers wishing to speak on this topic? Seeing none, I will close uh, public comment. And uh, let's see, so to recap, I think that the two items that have been brought up, um, Jean, you brought up the first one, which was um, if the amendment is required is zero, then there would be no required um, on-site handicapped parking. Uh, again, and this is due to the site conditions. Um, and I think what we need to to get to is whether there is a proposal or perhaps, um, Jean, if this is something that you would want to work together with Darcy on before the next, or, or David, before the next um, meeting on, on Monday the 5th, to look at language to address some of these existing condition uh, challenges that we've been speaking to um, or if you have any specific language recommendations that you would like to propose this evening that uh, Darcy and the commission consider. And I'll see David or, or Jean, if you have um, an opinion. I'd, I'd be happy to, um, to, to work with the disability commission, um, but um, I think Jean, Jean should also be involved uh, since he, uh, I think we each have one particular concern that we that we were focused on. No, I'd be happy to do that too. Darcy, does that sound amenable to to you? Oh, sure. Okay, great. Um, Ken or Melissa, are there any other questions or comments that that you have um, before we before we close this item and move on to the next Warren article? Uh, I, I, just one more quick thing with with respect to Mr. Seltzer, uh, um, my condo uh, building uh, does have geographically designated parking spaces, so um, uh, we can't easily reassign them. Thanks, and I think Darcy did speak to the the, the burden that that does place on those looking for um, for spaces as for, for for potential living situations as well. Great, uh, Darcy, did you have any other questions for the board before we move on to the next? I don't think so. Great. I, I'll, somebody will contact me, is that how it works? Yes. Okay, great. We'll, we'll reach out. Great, so with that, we will close uh, Article 47 and move to Article 48, which is a zoning bylaw amendment uh, regarding ADA and MAAB standards in administration and enforcement. This is also inserted by the select board at the request of the Disability Commission. Uh, Darcy, will you be speaking to this one as well? Um, again, just for anybody who hasn't read some of the stuff in advance, um, this is a warrant article that we that we came up with, not like the other one. It's not that that we've known about this problem for a while. In essence, in the last year. Um, we just talked to the building inspector the other day and he, he agrees. Development is really um, uh, busy in Arlington right now and we're missing things. We're not catching things in time. And the Commission on Disability is really, is really trying to get earlier in the process so that it's better for everyone. Um, 
so that things that we could see wouldn't work don't have to go through a long process and then come back. And then I just want to make sure that ADA and MAAB are getting thought of earlier in the process. Because as I said, if you wait until the end or near the end, then you go through a whole, if it's the ADA, you wait until the building opens and then someone sues and then that drags on. And that's not, we don't want to be confrontational about it. And it's not fair to the person with disabilities to make them again, to have them the burden of making things accessible. So I just like it to get in earlier. Um, and I talked to town council about this and we went through a couple of different scenarios and decided that again, the simplest thing is to just say, it's gotta be in here. You have to think about it. I imagine um, one of the things we could do is uh, what you ended up doing with the Lexington Hotel, where it ends up as a, a sentence in the, in the MOU, in the Memorandum of Understanding that says that they will comply with all of the, all of the regulations that need to be complied with. So we're hoping that that would be acceptable to the ARB we're not asking you to be the enforcers. That's, that's not the point at all. Um, but we would like more attention paid to it in an earlier state where it's more possible to, you know, do the thing that you do in the EDR and negotiate back and forth and say, can you try it this way and so forth. So that's pretty straightforward. Great, thank you very much. I will uh, now turn it over to the board for questions. And this time we'll start with Ken. Uh, I have no questions. I'm generally supportive of this right now. I think uh, you know, it's not changing any of the rules. You just want the rules followed. And I think we can definitely do that. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Jean, any questions? Yeah, I agree with Ken. It seems pretty straightforward. I thought it was something that uh, the building inspector was doing either with issuing the building permits or the occupancy permits. So I think it's fine to have it here also. Uh, David, any questions? Uh, no, I, I don't have any objection. Uh, Melissa, any questions? Melissa? <laughs> she may be on mute. Uh, so I'll, I'll go ahead and, and um, identify too. I, again, I have um, no no issues with the with the intent of this. I think that my only request would be to see if we could um, specifically refer to the state building code and accessibility standards um, rather than rather than specifically call out the individual sections of the building code. And the reason being so um, is that I'd like to be consistent in the fact that we don't call out all of the other subsections of the, of the building code. I think just in terms of writing um, zoning bylaws and, and policy um, having, you know, we went through the recodification process to, to remove a lot of these um, specific sections that would need to be updated um, when the, the model building code is, is updated or, or changed. So if, um, if you would be amenable to, um, to state building, you know, looking at a language that was, that was less specific to the individual code sections, I, I think that would be in line with, with what we had previously looked to achieve in the um, recodification process. But I certainly have no, no objection to the in, intent. Uh, any other questions? Um, I did. Nothing, please. Is, is everyone else? Okay. Um, two things. One is I did want to say that, yes, the building inspector is responsible for um, 
uh, doing this 5 to 1 CMR, which means Commonwealth of Massachusetts regulations. Yeah, um, yeah you guys all know that. Um, it, he is responsible for doing that particular evaluation, but at that point, it's much later in the game. Um, and it seems to me that we would get farther if we were doing it earlier, if we were brought into these conversations earlier, because as I've pointed out, you know, you don't know what you don't know. So it's very hard for people to understand exactly how the ADA could affect people, various parts of it. Um, and it's very hard to, to make, the ADA is minimums. It's really your legal minimums. It's the, it's the least you should do. So sometimes there's a way of doing an even better, more inclusive, you know, not just for people with disabilities, but I don't know, parents with strollers. Um, so I'd like to have that in there, but I also, I'm afraid, Rachel, I didn't quite understand. Do you mean, I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, the wording of D here. And are you saying that, that where applicable accessibility standards set forward in is not I, how you want to word it? I, I think if we want to specifically highlight accessibility standards, standards, it would be and where applicable accessible accessibility accessibility standards period uh, because the uh, Mass Architectural Access Board is governing 521 CMR which is already covered under the state building code so again um, I, I think what I'd like to do is you know again we don't then separately call out um, life safety or um, or elevator code. I mean, there's so many different things that you could add add in here. And so rather than and, 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 um, again, I, I have no issue with, with specifically highlighting accessibility standards, but I think I would end, end this there rather than calling out the specific code sections, which are already included under the wording of state, state building code. Let me think about that. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, um, is it now public co comment time? Is that we what can, happens now? We, we can do that if, unless anyone has any other questions. Okay, so uh, at this point we will open up uh, for public comment. Uh, please use the, the raise hand function. I'll remind everyone you, have, you will have three minutes when I call on you. Please state your first, last name and address for the record. And we will start with Christian Klein. Thank you, Madam Chair. Christian Klein, 54 Newport Street, um, speaking as a resident. Um, just a couple of brief points. Um, I, I do like the proposed revision to removing uh, the specific uh, lines about the specific standards that are to be followed. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act as a federal statute is typically not enforceable at the local level. But it's a civil action as opposed to regulatory action. And I think it's confusing to um, have it here be something where it is being, um, <clears throat> excuse me, required at a local level, especially where it does sometimes conflict with uh, with, uh, with Mass AAD regulation. And I also um, just wanted to say that something like this might be um, better served in uh, Title VI of our regular bylaws as opposed to being a part of the, the zoning bylaws. That section, Title VI, is specifically is about building regulations within the, within the town. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Don Seltzer. Thank you again, Don Seltzer, Irving Street. I speak in support of this article, but I do not think that it goes far enough. It should really be part of the environmental design review process. And I hope that maybe at a future town meeting, this board will consider adding this as a 13th standard to the dozen that the board currently considers for every special permit. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any other members of the public wishing to speak regarding this Warren article? All right, seeing none, 
we will uh, move on from public comment. Sorry, let me get my agenda back up. Great. Uh, so any other board members uh, wishing to to speak, have any questions for, for Darcy or any thoughts on the proposed um, uh, uh, change to the, to the wording that I suggested? No? Gene? I'm fine, I'm fine to the change in the wording suggests that I don't think it changes what the outcome is gonna be and makes it a little well, clearer. No, the, it certainly isn't meant to change the in, intent. Uh, so, Darcy, is that something that you would uh, be willing to consider? Well, um, I think I understand the point about the taking out the ADA. Um, I would tend to put in the MAAB only because the MAAB regulations are um, uh, more extensive um, and have slightly uh, higher standards in many ways than the ADA does and they are state laws. Um, so I, I would like to, I'm okay with taking out the ADA, but I think I think I would say accessibility standards, um, uh, including the Massachusetts Architectural Access Board without, without referencing, I mean, the whole CMR and all that kind of thing, just that it is, it is the board that you would, for example, ask for a variance. Great. Well, let's um, let me take another look at that then again between now and and uh, Monday as well, and I'll certainly reach out to you with with any questions. But I, I appreciate you taking a look at the at the um, proposed uh, adjustments to the language. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate you uh, bringing both of these Warren articles to our attention. Thank you for for hearing this. This is great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, with that, we will move on from Article 48 to Article 46, which is a zoning bylaw amendment regarding a teardown moratorium. And this was inserted at the request of Lynette Culverhouse. Is uh, Lynette Culverhouse with us this evening? Yes, I am. Fantastic. Uh, so if you would like to uh, present this, uh, this uh, zoning warrant article, you will have uh, three minutes. If I could just ask you to please Introduce yourself by first, last name, and address. Yes, my name is Lynette Culverhouse. I live on Draper Avenue. I'm a town meeting member in Precinct 11. And um, I am introducing this um, two-year moratorium on teardowns um, in order to um, invite the town to take the time to actually um, address the issues around teardowns related to um, affordable housing, um, the environmental impact of teardowns and um, the uh, fact that um, we're tearing down trees. Um, this moratorium applies to small houses and capes um, based on uh, the research done by um, the Geographic uh, Information Survey um, system uh, that applies to 871 houses in Arlington. Um, okay, next, next, next. Can you move on? Next. Okay, here's an example of a, no, the one before. No. More, this, <laughs> where, did I go too far? Oh, the White House, I think you went too far. There you go. This one? Yes. Okay. This is an example Bye. of a cape. I hope I get another minute for this. This is an example of uh, a cape in my neighborhood, a beautifully well-kept, well-maintained cape that was sold for 600,000 and was replaced by, the next slide, this that sold for 1,425,000, 1, no longer a relatively affordable home. Next slide. This is, um, the, the houses in um, a year's period uh, that were sold and uh, were torn down and rebuilt. The blue is the selling price of the original house 
and the green is the uh, price of the, the, the building that replaced it. As you can see in almost every case, the, the cost of the house more than doubled. Next. Um, there's um, the main statistics here I want to focus on is the fact that house prices increased by 129% since the year 2000, whereas wages have only increased by between three and 4.3%. Next. Um, and research shows very clearly that the environmental impact of a teardown is far more severe than renovation and reuse. Um, next. So why are we tearing down good houses? Next. This is motivated by um, money and profit. Profit for the developer, increased tax revenue for the town, and larger commissions for real estate agents. Next one. I think that this is a moral dilemma when money is what's driving our decisions that affect the well being of people and our planet. In Arlington, we have two crises the demand action. We, have, we are in a climate crisis and we have a net zero plan. So we need to start walking the talk. And we have inadequate affordable housing to meet the, meet the growing need. Next. So in conclusion, um, I wanna say that, um, that capes and our older homes represent an era of architectural history that we are destroying. And as um, a re um, original citizen of England and seeing how um, People from other countries love to come to Europe and look at the old buildings. We have a short history. And I think that we need to preserve the architectural history that we have uh, so that future generations will be able to have a sense of, of the value of that. And of course, the, um, the um, inevitable outcome of the climate crisis demands that we take bold action and change the, the way that we are living now. And I think that it just can't wait. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I will now turn it over to members of the board to ask any questions. Uh, we'll start with Jean. Thank you, and, and thank you, Lynette, for presenting the um, article and for your discussion of it. I'm wondering if you've read the staff's um, memo about your article, and if so, if you'd like to respond to it. No, I haven't. Uh, I didn't receive it. Uh, it was in the agenda for tonight's meeting. Okay. I, no, I didn't. Yeah, it would probably be a good idea if you read it afterward before you yep. come back next time. Um, what do we do about an existing homeowner who wants to demolish part of his or her or their house and to build on their house. So let's say their family's expanding and you know, rather than sell and move, they'd like to do something with their existing house. This seems to say that they couldn't do it for the two years uh, during the moratorium. Was that your intention? No, that was not my intention. And I would expect that during the two year uh, moratorium, the town would actually address that issue. Um, so we would have to amend your language because the language doesn't give the town the ability to give some leeway to current homeowners who might want to do exactly what I said. So would you be okay with that sort of amendment to, to the proposal? I would be okay on to, to working on that, yes. I, I realized that that was a piece that was missing and, um, and, and need, needed to be addressed. Similarly, you have a situation where a home is damaged, flood, fire, something like that. And at that point, it makes more sense to take it down and build a new one rather than try to um, build up what was damaged in some way. Again, this would not allow that to happen. And theoretically, you would have homes that were damaged that couldn't be built up for a couple of years 
Are you willing to modify this for that too? Yes, if it was damaged beyond repair, but I am very concerned with the um, environmental impact of teardowns. And if it is at all possible to repair a home, that would be um, preferable. Well, it's, it's, it's somewhat, I mean, they're always possible to repair, but you have to look at the costs of repairing as a, compared to the cost of starting from scratch. So for many people, or in some circumstances, it would make more sense and maybe the only way they could afford to do it is to start from scratch rather than deal with a significantly damaged structure. So where are you on that part of it? Well, I think that there needs to be a fair amount of education on the environmental cost also, that it, it needs to not be well, always centered on financial costs, but we need to start as residents, as a town, as a country, as a, a world, we have to start addressing the environmental cost. So if your house, God forbid, were to burn down or be severely damaged in some way, and it would cost a million dollars to rebuild it with the sticks that are remaining, or $800,000 to take it down to the foundation and rebuild it, which, which would you choose? No, I already said that if it was be, if it was destroyed beyond repair, then no, no, it's not. It's not destroyed beyond repair. It would just cost cost more money to repair than to start anew. Which would you choose? I I think that's a very hard question to answer because how do you evaluate the extent of the damage? You would get estimates. You would get estimates, and you determine which you think would be a better way for you to go as the homeowner. I'm just concerned, Lynette, that we are tying the hands of homeowners in this sort of situation, which I think is, is very unfair to families and under those circumstances. So I'd like I, you to sort of think about that too. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And, and that is, um, I have thought about that. And I, I agree that it's not adequately addressed as is. Um, so, so let's say there's somebody in, in one of these houses that you're proposing the moratorium on, and they could sell the house for, I don't know, $600,000, let's posit, if the moratorium's in place. But if there were no moratorium in place, a developer would pay them $800,000, let's say, for the house. So how do you feel about the homeowner not being able to take advantage of that $200,000 for those couple of years because of the moratorium? Well, I would need to know whether that's an actual fact that there would be that much difference. Well, yes, the there, often, there often is. I know? think that, that, I mean, part of what needs to be done is the education around this and um, a focus on the value of our older buildings. I'm just wondering if, because I have a lot of sympathy to where you're trying to get to with this, but I'm concerned about the moratorium part because of the consequences I mentioned and because of consequences that are probably unintended that I haven't thought of. But I'm just wondering whether it would make more sense to just have the part of your um, article that's the study and the report back. So we have two more years where clearly some houses would get torn down during those two years, but it might be a fairer result than having a two-year moratorium at the end of the two years, in either event, we'd have the study and report. I wonder what your feeling would be on that way to go. Um, I'd be open to discussing that. Okay, I, I would too, but let's, let's see what my colleagues on the ARB have to say. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you, Jean. David. Uh, thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Lynette, for bringing this to us. Um, so 
I, I agree with all of the issues that you identify in your purpose section. Um, those are all things that, that we all need to be very concerned with. Um, however, I also agree with um, Jean's concerns. And uh, I also would um, urge you to focus on the, the study aspect of this. I would actually go further with respect to the concern that Jean identified, because I, I think that that the moratorium um, uh, really seriously um, um, impacts uh, the financial interests of homeowners in Arlington um, beyond whether they might be able to rebuild after after damage or or uh, or you know build an addition, um, I think during this two year period, it would significantly impact um, their ability to to monetize the investment in their house if they were to choose to, to try to sell it. Um, and, you know, I that seems um, to some extent unfair to the homeowners and, and perhaps an illegal burdening of their property rights. Um, and so I, I, I think um, if we if we focused on on the study part of this to know exactly what we're talking about, because honestly, it's not even a hundred percent clear from the language of your proposed amendment exact uh, which properties in Arlington would be impacted by this, because it isn't clearly limited to say single families uh, throughout throughout the language of the proposal. Um, and the department uh, did an analysis based on some assumptions that uh, even with those assumptions, which were pretty conservative, it would impact a lot of homes all over town. Um, and uh, if your intention was that it was that it would cover even more homes than what the department assumed in their analysis, um, I mean, we're, it's it's potentially affecting thousands of homeowners in Arlington and their and their very real financial interests over the next two years. Um, so for that reason, uh, I would urge you to focus on on the study aspects and uh, I'll, I'll pass it along to my colleagues. Great. Thank you, David. Uh, Melissa. Hi, thank you, Lynette, for presenting this. I think, you know, in terms of, you know, the intent of what you're going for, I, you know, I think Again, I can sympathize with that. There are these larger forces. I guess, um, you know, with the time that you would propose this two year moratorium, what would you hope would be the outcome after those two years? I would hope that we would have um, a set of standards um, for um, maintaining, um, for focusing on um, renovation and reuse rather than tear down, um, the preservation of mature trees. Um, and I would, I definitely want to address the homeowner aspect. Um, what, what I was primarily focused on when I was um, thinking about this article was um, the sale of small homes to developers and the total tear down in order to make a huge profit. And um, just so saddened to see so many beautiful little homes getting sold, getting torn down. Um, and then maybe to Jenny or Aaron, in terms of looking at the housing production plan um, out there in the world, have you seen incentives for preserving smaller existing homes? I mean, other than setting up residential guidelines on, you know, kind of square footage are there things out there that we could look at as more like carrots versus sticks? Um, but not, I'll talk to that, um, Rachel, please. Um, not, not specifically for this type of the, the model that you might be suggesting. I mean, other than a first time home buyer program or uh, down payment assistance or something along those lines, which we do participate in a regional program related to that. So, um, it's not a, a lot of money, but it could be uh, an area where we focus greater attention, perhaps. Um, beyond that, I wouldn't say that it's about preservation of the structure. It's more about 
uh, home, home, first time home buyers. Um, there have been examples in the past of the Housing Corporation of Arlington um, engaging in uh, basically acquisition of two family structures for preservation and then renting them out. Um, they're not currently doing a program like that, but it, you know, with the right scale and sort of bundling of many, many properties, it can be possible, but on a case by case, you know, sort of individual property preservation, it doesn't, um, I wouldn't say that that would be something the town would necessarily pursue just in and of itself without perhaps the other incentives that I was talking about, like first time home buyer assistance or down payment assistance. Um, and that can be something that look, that is looked at in greater detail through the housing production plan process, which was, I think, what you were originally talking about. Yeah, and then just if you could update me on, um, remind me the number of single family homes in Arlington and then the average tear down annually. Um, Aaron or Kelly, if you want to chime in on our um, I don't know those. If that's easy or not, sometimes mm -hmm. it's on them. Um, I can I can chime in. This is Kelly Line, I'm a senior planner. Um, when we studied this as part of the 2019 report on demolitions and replacement homes, we were looking at an average of about 27 homes a year that were torn down. Um, but that was that was combining so two family homes on it is two two. We we're looking at 27 units being torn down a year um, and replaced, and those were pretty much across town. I believe um, I'm trying to remember roughly how many you asked how many single family homes or how many. Um, homes? Yeah, because I felt like this one was addressing the single family home. Yeah, so we have um, 8,001 single family homes in town per a recent um, poll on assessors' data. Okay. And can I just answer that? I think that it's uh, averages out to about 20 single family homes a year. Okay, okay. We also did provide a map um, which would outline the number of potential properties that would be impacted by this bylaw. I just need to grab that and I'll pull it up. Melissa, did you have any other questions while Jenny's pulling up the map? No, not at this time, thanks. Okay, great. Uh, so Ken, while Jenny's pulling up the map, do you have any uh, questions for the uh, uh, the Warren article petitioner? Um, no, I, I think I generally very much agree with uh, Gene and David in what they said earlier. Uh, I think this does put a undue burden on existing homeowners. And um, I'm not sure the, the more term is the way to go. Uh, about the just um, capturing the character of, of existing homes and even uh, keeping uh, trees. Um, I think we should address those head on instead of just having a moratorium and having all the existing homeowners uh, pay for this, uh, uh, this, for this wait and see study. Uh, I think we should do it right now and not put a more term on it. Thank you, Ken. Uh, or Aaron, is there anything, bless you, is there anything that uh, you would like to say about the, the map that you have up on the screen now? Kelly, do you wanna to speak to the map? Sure, um, this is just based on um, assumptions based on the petitioner's um, proposed amendment. So again, I'm not 100%, she said, uh, I believe like 800 something homes. Subject. Okay, um, when we looked at the assumptions that we wrote about in the memo, it came out to um, actually, I think about almost 2,800. Um, so this map shows the location of those 2,800, um, the parcels on which those 2,800 single family homes sit. And we've also identified um, homes that are already under some sort of historic preservation or on um, the local inventory of historic and architecturally and culturally significant properties. Uh, with the exception of the recent 2018 edition, which is not yet in our town's GIS. Great, thank you so much, Kelly. Mm are there any other uh, questions for Lynette from any of the board members before I open this up for public comment? 
and you'll have to speak up because I can't see you all on my screen. Uh, no, nothing for me. Okay, great. Thank you. So with that, we will uh, open this uh, article up for public comments. Please use the raise hand function in uh, the participant section if you would like to speak. I'll remind you each speaker will have up to three minutes. Please identify yourself by your first, last name, and street address. We will start with uh, Patricia Warden. Uh, actually, uh, my- John Warden. Uh, am I unmuted? You are, we can hear you. Yeah, okay, for some reason when Patricia is kind enough to tackle the uh, computer to get me on these lists and stuff, it comes up as PB War. Uh, but that, that, that's actually John Warden from Jason Street. Thank you. Uh, uh, <clears throat> for the, the uh, in, in 2016, um, a group of citizens presented some articles to reform the zoning bylaw. Uh, and, one of, and part of the goal of these was to address the teardown issue by uh, the teardown mansionization issue, which Ms. Culver House. Uh, very aptly described um, is um, what what was what was the target of one of the things not not to prevent it but at least to make it a public process uh, that would require a, a hearing before the zoning board so the public would have a right to say something and maybe persuade a board to to say no you can't do that um, the the only result unfortunately the unholy alliance of brokers and and developers and put out a really pack of lies and, and no help from the planning board, the um, planning department, uh, the, we were unable to muster sufficient votes to get these amendments approved. But the one thing that did come out of it was that a residential study group was established to tackle this, this very issue. What, do, what could be done about um, teardowns and mansionization? And a, a committee was appointed, and they had meetings, and but they never they never really got to that issue, because when they had the temerity to oppose the uh, the uh, one of the in many ADU articles that we've been trying to ram through, uh, they were summarily dismissed and dissolved and were ghosted and then dismissed. So that study that should have started five years ago it is now uh, is now again before you. And what you're saying is, well, let's not do anything firm. Let's study it some more. Well, we've had time. We've lost five years when there sh should have been studies and nothing has happened. And the teardowns go on apace. And you know, there, there are a lot of, as pointed out by the map there, 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 there are a lot of homes that are already under some uh, level of protection. Of course, those in the historic district, um, those don't get torn down. And, and uh, a lot of people, uh, it's a very small percentage of all the houses in town, but uh, people move into these districts because they have some assurance that their neighborhood is not going to be messed up the way so many other neighborhoods are messed up. So, and if their house has damage or something, it gets fixed. Uh, and the other houses are on the, the, the inventory list, but unhappily, uh, what happens is the developers buy them anyway then they, they have them on the put them on the shelf and the year runs out and it's only a year in Arlington uh, they uh, the bulldozer comes in so the, time if you could wrap up please well I just I, I just want to say I, I hope we will support the moratorium I think it, yeah yeah there may be some inconveniences for some people we're talking about demolition uh, not not fires and so on and, and I think to to say let's study first and do something later. We tried that, it didn't work. So let, let, let's do something affirmative and to meet all those worthy goals that Ms. Culver House uh, so aptly described earlier. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Patty Muldoon. Thank you. Um, great appreciation to- oh, Sorry, oh, if you could just- oh, I'm sorry. Please. Thank you. Patty Muldoon, Smith Street. Thank you. Um, Great appreciation for bringing this article forward. I'm one of those homeowners that would, could be affected. I live in a Cape and my whole neighborhood is changing. 
because I don't live in a historic district. Uh, two houses down from me, a beautiful house was torn down with two giant spruce trees with an owl in it that lived there. Now there's almost no ground left. It's just a giant mansion under development. And that's everywhere I turn um, in my neighborhood. So I'm one of what those people that you want to have pity on and say, well, the homeowner could lose money. Well, if I sold, maybe I wouldn't make as much money. Um, but why, why should I reap the rewards that someone else is harmed by, by these incredible housing prices that we see around us? Um, I think it is doing great harm to the town of Arlington, and I want to urge this board to please work with Ms. Culver House to uh, put in some amendments that would make it a little more acceptable, a little more functional, targeting single family homes, targeting, you know, if you've had a flood or fire, you know, those kinds of issues are completely valid and would make this a more useful article but i am i studying longer when so much change is happening to our town i feel like i'm i'm we're turning into our expensive neighborhood neighboring towns rather than arlington and i i've been here over 30 years I love this town. What's happening to us right now is horrendous. And I can speak as a former member of the tree committee. I can speak as a conservationist. I can speak on multiple levels, but I speak to you as a homeowner asking you to please work together to make this a viable, active article that town meeting can really work with because studying it while the houses are being torn around us all the time, we don't have time to study, but a moratorium makes the greatest sense. Give us some breathing space. It's not like, you know, homeowners that want to sell won't make money. It's your time. Thank you. Thank Thanks you so very much. Uh, the next speaker will be Ellen Cohen. Hi, I'm Ellen Cohen. I live at 48 Park Street in East Arlington. I'm also speaking as a, as a homeowner. My house is an 1854 Cape that is not historic, but it is um, a wonderful home that was originally one of the farm workers' homes. Um, I, I actually am speaking from feeling extremely harassed by builders, that builders seem to have a lot of control in this town. Um, I am constantly being offered outrageous um, cash prices for my home. I have no interest in selling. I have to you know, speak and advocate for myself at these times. Um, at one point, I was afraid something would happen to my home, um, that it would be destroyed and I would have to sell. Um, I shouldn't have to feel like I can't rebuy my own home. I could not afford to put up the same kind of home as my neighbors. Um, I'm, I'm surrounded by a million dollar homes. There's fewer and fewer of the smaller um, single families on my street. Um, I've had seniors ar around me in tears because they had such pressure to sell and they did not end up putting the houses on the market that they just sold to a single builder who offered them a price they couldn't refuse. Um, I, I'm in, I appreciate this effort um, to have a moratorium. I think the town needs to look at what we're doing. I am actually um, enjoying the diversity in, in my, on my street that um, there's low income, there's um, very wealthy people on my street. It's very interesting 
Um, but I can see that it's not going to stay this way. And um, the few houses that are remaining are, you know, like myself, being pressured to sell. Um, so I, 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 at this point, think that there's no, no more time to study. There's time for, um, a, you know, a, a really firm action that makes the town think about what we're doing here. Thank you. Thank you. And I apologize, when you um, began speaking, I don't know that we uh, received your address, if you wouldn't mind. Oh, I did. I said 48 Park Street. Thank you so Park. much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, the next speaker will be Carl Wagner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Carl Wagner, uh, 30 Edge Hill in Arlington. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, just to speak to some of the board's comments, the, the purpose of, of this laudable suggestion by Ms. Culberhouse, I think is not to inconvenience homeowners. In fact, it's to allow generations of homeowners to be able to continue to afford Arlington, to stay in Arlington, and to be able to move to Arlington. And as we've seen over the last 12 months, we're increasingly talking about trying to appeal to diverse people. And I don't mean appeal because we're a nice town, but appeal because we're affordable and they can move in. Um, the people who would be temporarily uh, disabled would be developers who buy properties and then flip them. And in the last couple of years, you can look at the research in Arlington, the average purchase price that the developers are paying is $600,000 to $650,000 for little capes, like the house I bought that allowed me to move into Arlington. And uh, they are then turning them around for more than double that price, about 1.5 million. This destroys our natural affordability. As some of you won't believe, and I didn't believe till I looked at it, Arlington is the cheapest town of all the towns around us that touch us that are contiguous, except for Medford. Cheapest to rent in and cheapest to purchase in. And this means that people can move into older apartments and rent for a lower cost than around us and still get good services like schools. But it also means that people can hope to buy that house that you saw Ms. Culver House describe because they have just enough money to make their mortgage like I did when my wife and I moved into East Arlington. Oh, but actually, as Ms. Culverhouse pointed out to you, that house is gone. And these houses are disappearing. Our natural affordability is disappearing. June 23rd, 2020, our town manager said that housing is one of the biggest sources of inequality and, and racist problem in our town. Well, at that time, I disagreed with what he said because I thought he was talking about zoning. And he was saying, oh, if we get rid of zoning, I, I thought we would somehow make ourselves more anti-racist. What Ms. Culverhouse is actually doing is trying to give you an inclusive, helpful, anti-racist zoning law. And I, I, I encourage you, since this comes before you in your town offices and town boards over and over again, to realize the taxpayers are asking you to work with Ms. Culver House or a similar uh, proposal to make sure that these small houses are still here as the owners move on and leave them instead of the owners sell them to a developer who destroys them very much. Thank you. The next speaker will be Don Seltzer. Thank you, Don Seltzer, Irving Street. I just wish to clear up some numbers that have been given tonight. It has been reported to the board that there are 2,799 smaller homes built before 1950 that could be affected by the smaller target. That is not correct. It is based upon some very broad assumptions and it overstates the number by more than a factor of three. The actual inventory is about 871 homes. About 10 of those are two family. Um, I'd be very happy to explain in detail if the board is interested. Otherwise, uh, I thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Colleen Cunningham or Stuart. Hi, it's actually Stuart Borson again. We're on uh, Kensington Park. Um, I just wanted to say or speak out in favor of Mrs. Culverhouse's uh, proposal here. Uh, the goal is very clear, and I think everyone understands that the point is to limit teardowns that are performed by developers. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Benson 
took the opportunity to ask a bunch of questions about, you know, possible but real corner cases, rare events. And he used that as a way to smear and to sort of obfuscate the actual purpose of this warrant, which is actually pretty frustrating because if the uh, proposal for ADUs had been nitpicked this much uh, by the board, it wouldn't have gone anywhere. But unfortunately, the board didn't nitpick that particular issue. So why are we nitpicking this one here when clearly there's a lot of public support for some sort of moratorium on teardowns? And so therefore, what I'd like to do is challenge the board to actually work with Ms. Culberhouse here, exactly as you did with Barbara Thornton, uh, and craft a um, you know, fix the language that's in here so that it actually is something that addresses the points raised by Mr. Benson. And honestly, I think Mr. Benson's smart enough to do that because some of the issues he raised are easy enough to um, take care of by just putting a time limit on the amount of time you have to own your house before you can make some of the changes involved. And regarding corner cases like, well, if you buy it and then two months later it burns down, what do you do? Those sorts of things can be, you know, easily thought of and taken care of by smart people. So I urge you to work with this Culver House here. This um, moratorium has a lot of public support. It makes a lot of sense. And rather than obfuscating, I think it's time for the board to actually do something proactive to help move this into the town meeting. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Steve Revelak. Good evening, Madam Chair. Steve Revelak, 111 Sunnyside Avenue. Uh, first, a technical comment. Um, if the board does decide to move forward with this, uh, I would encourage you to tighten up the language so that two people can measure it and not have one get 800 and one get 2,000 and some. But uh, at a previous warrant article hearing, uh, a member of the public talked about living in their grandfather's two-family home. And uh, the grandfather bought this for $40,000 back in 1978, which would be roughly $168,000 in today's, you know, today's dollars. So it's currently worth a million dollars. And, you know, so the value increased by a factor of six. And this is, this is a used home in Arlington. Now, the planning department's memo for this article talks about, you know, their efforts to identify properties that might be subject to the moratorium, and they calculated an average value of $721,000 per home. And you got to realize that these are the smaller low end of our single family housing stock that were built before 1950. Again, used homes, but they're still nearly quarter of three quarters of a million dollars. Now, I understand that new homes are expensive, particularly if you've just had to, say, pay a construction crew several months to, to build it. But my point is that Arlington's used houses are really pretty expensive, too, and they account for roughly 90 percent of the properties sold during a given year here. So this is used houses are where our market is. Once upon a time, you could buy a one or two family home for not a lot of money here. I, I honestly think those days are behind us and uh, they probably will not be returning anytime soon. I mean, it'd be nice to buy a home for three or four hundred thousand dollars. But when the you know, just the land itself is four or five, it's, it's just not going to happen. Um, this is a function of you know, regional pressures, jobs, a lot of demand and years of, you know, basically not building nearly enough housing as we've needed. So I, I think that Arlington and communities around us are going to have to make a choice over the next couple of years. I mean, we can keep the housing that we built 75 years ago and accept the fact that it's likely to continue to get more and more expensive, or we can start allowing smaller, denser housing that requires less land per dwelling unit. So, I mean, I know, you know, teardowns have, teardowns have a bad rap, and, but I have to be honest, the only issue I have with them is that the new homes are single family instead of four plexes or six plexes. You know, in most of the town, you can only build a single family home and that's what we get. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. The next speaker will be Matthew Owen. Hi, I'm Matthew Owen. I'm at uh, 164 Forest Street. Uh, and I'd at least, yeah, I'd like to thank the members of the public who were very clear in that their opposition or that their support of this particular measure was because they're opposed to tearing down old beautiful houses because I think that is a very honest account of where this is coming from. Um, very much sort of an aesthetic sense. Um, whereas the arguments about affordability are ones that I don't think are particularly 
particularly realistic. Um, so I bought my house here seven months ago, um, and it doesn't quite qualify for this moratorium since it was built in 1952, I believe, but is a, one of these smaller homes. And I can tell you it was not affordable. Um, I feel very privileged to have been able to buy in this town. I was nearly priced out of it. And as Steve Revlack just said, things are not going backwards unless we can come up with a much larger supply of houses um, or at least homes on the smaller end of things. And the zoning, current zoning bylaws don't allow that. Um, I, yeah, I think if you are serious about affordability and environmental things, um, then you should really consider um, changing the zoning bylaws so that teardowns can be replaced by duplexes or triplexes or, or larger. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Karen Samuelson. Okay. Actually, it's my husband, Gary. Hi, my name is Gary Holly. I reside at 18 Tower Road in Arlington. And uh, I'm speaking as both uh, a homeowner and the father of a child who attended uh, the local uh, public school. And I want to speak to that aspect of this because what I see happening is Arlington becoming segregated neighborhoods based on economic factors. Um, and if the neighborhoods are segregated, the schools are segregated. And one of the things I loved about the public school here in Arlington that my son attended was the diversity of all kinds of diversity in that school. And I see that disappearing as more and more houses get torn down in this neighborhood, replaced by 1.5 million mansions, in my opinion. And um, the, the diversity on an economic basis is just disappearing. And I fear that that has a, a trickle down effect on the schools and the community that um, is hard, is very difficult to assess, which is why I think a moratorium and a study on all of that is perfectly appropriate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who wish to speak on this topic? Okay, seeing none. Could I, oh shoot. Oh, I'm sorry, is there? Yeah, could I add to that? Uh, if you'd like to, to have, yep, you may have three minutes to, to speak as well, if you'd like to introduce yourself and your address or two. This is Karen Samuelson. I'm at, at 18 Tower Road as well. Um, just, um, there's just on so many levels of this, and it sounds like there's several issues. You know, I totally support the moratorium. I think that um, in our particular neighborhood, there's been a huge um, push to, you know, just tear down the single families and put up McMansions on postcard lawns that I actually think look aesthetically horrible. And there's not, you know, takes away from the green, green environment and trees and all that. And then of course, is a, you know, the affordability factor that people have been talking about. And a gentleman mentioned that, I think Matthew, his, his property was not very affordable, even though it was a small single family, but imagine if they had, built a McMansion there, then it would have been completely on, you know, on, 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 he would have been completely unable to figure out how to buy it. So I, I, I guess I'm saying I really strongly support this. It's been an issue that's been bothering me for, for years and I wish I had become more active sooner um, because I really feel like it's literally changed the landscape of Arlington physically, aesthetically and in terms of the people, you know, economically, in terms of the people who can even imagine coming here to look for a home. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Uh, any other members of the public wishing to speak? Okay, seeing none, we will uh, close public comment on uh, Article 46. And I will uh, look back to the to the board to see if there are any additional uh, questions for uh, Ms. Culverhouse. Uh, David. 
I just wanted to ask uh, maybe Jenny, uh, has town council taken a look at this and uh, done any analysis of the legal implications of, of the moratorium? Rachel, please Jenny. Um, so we, we evaluate all of the zoning bylaws with town council, my department does. Um, so that's already been evaluated. Um, and the suggestions that we made in the correspondence that we provided to the board outline our concerns and how we might um, address some of the issues in, in terms of sort of an interim, the sort of interim period that is being discussed that would happen during the moratorium. And I think that the board has now weighed in on some um, potential ways to address what would happen in the interim um, that we did not have when we were first evaluating uh, what was being proposed. Um, but yes, we review everything with town council. Any other uh, questions? Rachel, may I? Thank you. It, it's, it's not a question so much, but I just want to point out that in the actual wording of the article itself, where it says, older affordable homes, houses shall mean houses built before 1950 with a footprint of less than a thousand square feet. If we think of, and I think most people do, the footprint is sort of the outline of the foundation. And you're talking about houses that are two stories high with maybe dormers. You're talking about houses that are more than 2000 square feet in size that would fall within the moratorium, which I think is not the intention of Ms. Culver House, but the problem is it's in the Warren article itself, which sort of defines how far you can go with, um, with um, changes to the wording of the bylaw that she wants to make. So I think the problem is some of those houses are not older they're older if they're before 1950, but they might have been renovated. Small, and they're not all small, and they're not all affordable. So I think it's really very, very over-inclusive. And while I said at the beginning, I'm really sympathetic to, you know, some of what Ms. Culverhouse is interested in doing, I just think that this moratorium is much too broad for where the town should be going. And you know, I hope to be able to have us work with Ms. Culverhouse and see if we can either find something much more narrowly tailored that would work or end up with um, something where we come back in two years with something that's been studied and hopefully is something that people can agree on as a way to do something about what a lot of people have identified as a problem in town. Thank you, Jean. I'll, I'll just add as well that I, I think part of the um, part of the challenge here too is looking at this just from the standpoint of the age and size without taking into effect things such as maintenance over over time and the quality of the original building construction as necessary factors when you look at whether or not a building can be rehabilitated um, or or should should be torn down. Um, as a as a factor, and um, I think the the broadness that Jean was referring to is certainly a, a concern that I have as well. Any other uh, kin or Melissa? Any other questions or feedback from Ms. Culverhouse? Uh, my only suggestion is maybe we can work with this a little bit and have less uh, less stick and more carrot. Uh, with this and maybe put incentives in here where if they do tear that if they do tear down um, they have to replace it with something but like Steve said uh, maybe a duplex or a, or a um, three or four family so that it's actually truly addressing the uh, affordable housing by saying there's more of it so there's it's simply more affordable I mean, instead of just saying, let's stop it, I'm saying, let's take action on it and say, 
here's a carrot here. Here's what you can do if you want to uh, go around this moratorium. Little things like that that might um, shift our opinion a little bit of this uh, a little bit right now. And I think with that, it would certainly, I mean, you certainly saw the, the map in terms of all of the different zoning districts um, that, that, this, that this covers. I think that would be something that would need to, to come out from a from part of the study, though, wouldn't wouldn't you uh, agree that? Yes, I would agree. Great. So I I, um, I I believe that there are certainly members of the board who would be willing to to, to work with you if you were interested in reaching out in terms of uh, looking how to recraft this to really focus on the study and 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 the report, uh, Jean. And, and David, would would you agree with that assessment? Does that sum up your comments as well? I see nodding of head. Yes, although I'm not sure how much time I have since I committed to do one. That's true. So <laughs> see if somebody else can, or maybe the staff, I hate to put the staff at it because I know they're super busy also, but I am at the moment too. Great. So this would have to be done before next week, right? It would have to be done before next week. We are uh, reviewing and uh, and uh, going to be taking a, a vote on each one of the warrant articles on Monday evening next week. Right. A Thursday, specifically. Right. So I'm open to talking with people about how to recraft it. Um, there are people who are willing to do that. So I'd certainly be um, be happy to to speak with you if, if you um, were interested in in reaching out, um, and we can certainly at least start start from there and see how we can um, recraft this again to to focus more on the the study and the um, the report and looking at some of the the impacts I think that have been mentioned both tonight as well as in the. Um, as in the impact study that was created and presented by the uh, Department of Planning. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, we will now move on to uh, Article 49, uh, Zoning Bylaw Amendment relative to side yard sky exposure planes. And this was inserted at the request of Ted Fields. So is Ted Fields available this evening? Ted, I see you. I think you're on mute. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Ted Fields, 268 Renfrew Street. Great, thank um, you. And I submitted a slideshow for your review. What's in your agenda? If I could put that on the screen. Yes, thank you. Um, I'll go through this uh, quickly in my three minutes and then answer questions. Thank you. Um, large homes built on lots meant for smaller homes often produce oversized impacts on neighbors, as we've heard from previous testimony tonight. Uh, these impacts are magnified in older neighborhoods with smaller homes, particularly in post war subdivisions with single story capes and ranches. Next slide, please. Large new homes can substantially reduce neighbors' access to sunlight. Uh, open space and views disrupt established neighborhoods and tend to be more expensive than the homes they replace. And obviously these impacts um, worry residents um, who have been complaining about these impacts for a number of years now. Um, as previously mentioned, the master plan adopted in 2016 addresses the teardown rebuild phenomenon on page 53 and it recommends consideration of stricter dimensional controls such as setback controls, or in this case, side yard setbacks, as well as design guidelines in neighborhood conservation districts on page 177 to confront these impacts. Uh, as this graph shows, uh, the uh, living area um, for homes uh, built recently uh, in the past 10 years has been growing steadily um, and modern homes built in the last 10 years are much larger uh, than homes built in previous decades in terms of living area as tracked by the assessors. Um, and next slide. Uh, these impacts are most often felt on side yards. 
um, which tend to be um, much smaller um, than front and rear yards in Arlington, especially in the R1 and the R2 zoning districts. So Article 49 proposes to moderate the impacts of large new homes on lots in the R0, R1, and R2 districts um, by sky exposure planes in the side yard setbacks. Uh, sky planes are angles that start at a lot line and extend inward toward the center of the property and upward at defined intervals. Uh, buildings and structural, most structural components may not extend beyond or above sky exposure planes. Uh, by way of example, a uh, one-to-one -one side yard sky plane rises up one foot for every one foot of inward horizontal distance from the side lot lines it goes. Um, and practically sky exposure planes focus building height toward the center of the lot away from neighboring properties. Next slide, please. You can see that in this illustration, figure one, the blue arrows are the sky exposure planes. Um, and in this example, which is not drawn to scale, um, part of this building would be beyond the sky exposure planes. Um, on the lower left-hand side, you can see the, rise, the run and the rise uh, that defines the uh, sky exposure plane. Next slide, please. Here at, at time, if you could uh, wrap up, and I'm sure this is a very technical proposal. I'm it sure is, we'll yes. Of, well, I'm sure we'll have lots of questions for you there. I'm sure you will too. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just some quick facts. Uh, next, yes, thank you. Additions to homes are exempt from side yard exposure planes in Article 49 as are minor roof overhangs, gable roof ends, small dormers, and uh, most flush mounted solar energy systems. Um, sky exposure planes are also a more precise uh, way of controlling building mass. Um, and it allows builders and architects flexibility in controlling building mass and, and corralling it towards the center of the lot. Uh, it um, provides much more flexibility to developers and builders of new homes than cruder measures like expanded side yard setbacks. Um, and finally, Article 49 was not drafted to punish builders of large new homes or the people who live in them. What it does is it protects older dwellings from oversized impacts from larger abutters, uh, larger new abutters, I should say. It allows construction of larger home in, in response to current market conditions with a bit of new controls. Um, and it finally permits homeowners to make repairs and build additions on their homes without dealing with sky plane regulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so I will open it up to the board for uh, any questions and I'll start with Ken. Hey, Ted. Uh, Hi, how are hey, you? Good. Thank you. Thanks for bringing this in. Uh, I was, uh, one quick question for you. If we return back to that section uh, of the building with the uh, side yard sky exposure plane there. Yep. Uh, the one after this one. Ah, uh, sure. Okay. All right. So are you saying that that dash line is the, is the um, setback, right? Or, or with this, uh, with this override the setback. So on the lower floor, you can build all the way up till you touch the, the side yard setback. Uh, no, it, it doesn't override the side yard setback. It just governs how much building height can it can um, extend um, up to the side yard setback. It, it, okay, well, the way it's written, it's not that clear. I think we should add something if, if that's something that's, okay. gonna, that's there. Um, and the version I have, it shows an average finished grade uh, at lot. Yours yep. seems to be flat. Uh, well, in the actual motion itself, it, there's two illustrations. There's a flat illustration, and then there's a one for a, a, a non-flat lot. Yeah, because uh, most of, I mean, I say, not say most, but say a lot of Arlington is on hills, very hilly. Correct. I, I excluded that from the presentation in the interest of brevity, but yes. So if one side is much higher uh, on the, and uh, you take an average of it, that means hills, properties on hills 
have an advantage of, of getting, again, higher. And it would still block the neighbor because it's just, because it's on a hill. Right. Uh, this is not, I don't pretend this is a perfect um, motion. It's a start, mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's important to start and to address the issue and then refine it uh, later on. But that is uh, non-level lots do present different challenges than level lots. Did you get a chance to read what the planning department uh, I did, wrote? yes, I did, yep. And uh, what are your thoughts about uh, their recommendation of following the design guidelines? Uh, well, I think this uh, supports all of the main design principles in the design guidelines, uh, especially you know B1 through B3 and C1, um, especially in C1 with respect to large dormers um, and whatnot um, in new housing. Um, I would love to uh, incorporate the uh, sky plane concept into the guidelines to some degree, uh, but I think it's more important to um, incorporate them directly into the zoning bylaw itself as well. Uh, because as we know, the residential guidelines are just that, they're guidelines. They don't have the force of the zoning bylaw behind them. Okay, and then if it's a, if it's a non rectilinear lot, and it's kind of like pie shaped, mm -hmm. uh, or some weird shape, does that then do, then do you do an average of the property line to where the building is, or is a change as the building meets the property line? So let's say the property line flares out. Mm -hmm. That means your building get higher as it goes back, or if it's it's more of a inward. I'm, I'm see. I'm just trying to think of all the different examples that uh, I'm looking at here that I can't seem to get an answer for. It really depends. That's a very, that's a hypothetical situation. That's hard to answer because it really depends on the uh, ex, the uh, unusual geometry to give you an exact answer. Well, let's say you're in a cul-de-sac and all the lots are pie shaped. Yeah. All right. So the front of it, the lot lines the, uh, are much yep. closer to the building. But yep. as you get back to the rear yard, it, it flares backwards. So that means you, your house can, can continue to go up right. and up Again. on the skyline. Or where do you take that uh, skyline exposure plane from? It, it extends along the whole plane of the side yard setback. So in the case you're providing of a pie shaped lot, um, again, fundamentally these focus the, the tallest parts of the building in the center of the lot. So you will have, in the case of a pie shaped lot, you can have taller parts of the building mass up to the maximum height allowed in the zone in question uh, towards the center and the rear of the lot and less in the front of the lot given a triangular pie shaped lot because the side yard uh, setback lines are relatively closer together together given the geometry. Um, again, in that case, um, it won't be perfectly triangular because you have minimum frontage requirements that govern the uh, lot, assuming it's a conforming lot. All right. uh, I'm gonna leave my questions here for now and see what my other board members say, okay? Great, thank you, Ken. Uh, Melissa, any questions or comments? Hi, Ted. Um, How are you? <laughs> good. Um, thanks for bringing this to us. I think it's a creative way to kind of address some of the kind of massing issues and mansionization that people have been concerned about. Um, I think I am actually not familiar with the skyline uh, plane as much. You said in Cambridge and in mm -hmm. Natick. Mm -hmm. um, Those are local examples. It's more widely used in the Midwest, Mid-Atlantic states and out West. Okay. Um, so do you, do you happen to have maybe um, any images of how that translates? Um, I mean, I can see the, the, you know, obviously the diagram, but do you have them in like a form that I, like a house that took place maybe in Natick or Cambridge under this? Um, I can find some examples for you. I can send them to um, 
through the uh, planning department to the board. I think that would be interesting for me to see just how it manifests under this type of zoning. Sure. I think the design guidelines don't have the teeth that are that is needed, and that's what um, you do need to kind of control the massing on a bigger uh, redeveloped project. Um, curious about like balconies. I don't know if that was mentioned in one of the exemptions um, or can it, any outdoor kind of space on a building like that. Uh, balconies, uh, bear with me, let me review. Uh, uh, there's a number of exemptions. Um, gable ends, balconies right now are not um, exempted, but that I'm not averse to modifying that uh, reasonably. Yeah, uh, allowing. Again, these are more for single and two family homes, so the relative incidence of balconies is less than in multifamily properties. Right, right. I think I've just recently have seen some just kind of pop outs yep. to outdoor space and I don't know if the railing or something like that would then, you know, be limited under something like this. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be my request to see something that's built under this. And so that would be helpful. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Melissa. I'll go to David next. Up, oh, David, I think you're on mute. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, so this is this is a really interesting proposal. Um, it's much more technical than most of the proposals that come before us. And I, I, I wish we had more time mm -hmm. to dig into it and, um, and uh, understand what the potential impacts are. But uh, one thing I would be interested in is kind of the flip side of what Melissa asked for, which is um, as many examples as you could provide of things that were built in Arlington that could not be built if this were in effect um, and and how those planes um, would would look in those cases uh, that would help me understand um, sort of what what the impact would be uh, because obviously you wouldn't be proposing this if if we didn't already have a problem you were trying to solve correct um... I, I did provide uh, the first part of your request um, in terms of buildings that uh, are problematic um, with the materials yeah. I sent to the planning department okay. um, earlier, but I can, um, I can do um, some estimates on what they would look like with the side yard setback. Yeah. Um, again, I would, I, in the photographs, um, you know, that I show. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, I, I, I understand the basic diagrams uh, in the proposal, but I'm, I'm having a little trouble uh, visualizing mm -hmm. what it actually means for the examples. Right. Um, I, I can give you, I might have to work in hypotheticals because I can't really access people's private property and measure out sure. things, but I, I can give you a diagram that uh, I think would meet your needs. Okay. And, um, if, if the, what we're trying to get at here is, is reducing the massing of, of the homes. Um, I mean, our, our existing dimensional requirements uh, are, are at least an attempt to place limitations on how large a home can be. Um, is there, is there, um, do you think that it's not, uh, not possible for us to modify uh, the existing dimensional requirements uh, in order to to reduce the massing rather than introducing what is a fairly complex new analysis into the process? It is possible, but I'm going to actually answer your question with a, an observation in that the existing residential zoning standards, especially for dimensional controls, were largely uh, written in 1975 when the housing market was very different. 
um, when yeah. a lot of new homes that were being built were the one and a half story um, smaller homes, the two story smaller homes um, that didn't impact their neighbors to the degree that new homes built today under today's housing market, which is very different, are impacting their neighbors. Um, so yes, you can uh, revise uh, side yard setbacks, especially frontage requirements, um, even uh, maximum building heights. Um, I would argue that is a cruder and less precise way of combating the problem. As I see it, and, and I have direct experience, um, the 1600 square foot home next to me was uh, torn down and replaced with a 5600 square foot home. And you know the, the, the builders were great to work with, um, that I love my new neighbors there. I don't have anything against them, but the uh, zoning controls in place um, allowed them to build that type of home uh, right next to mine. And I don't mind it as much as my younger son does who looks out on a blank vinyl wall every day when he gets up. Um, so I think that we allow, builders will build to what they're allowed to build under zoning. And we have a 45 year old zoning bylaw with 45 year old or 50 year old uh, dimensional controls. And I think they need to be adjusted uh, to react to the modern housing market in Arlington, which is for given la uh, land costs is to maximize the size of the home that can be built within setbacks and other controls. Um, I think if we're going to modernize our zoning, we should use modern tools like a sky plane so that we really focus on allowing people to build to the 35 foot height limit, but build it in the center of the lot, not at the edges of the lot, which in many cases they're doing to maximize footprint. Um, I think that's more of a, a practical and an elegant solution than um, forcing, uh, you know, very wide side yards on, uh, you know, 6,000 square foot lots and really limiting the builders to what they can uh, build um, for the modern housing market. Um, but it certainly is an alternate, uh, an option to adopt a simpler but less precise um, series of controls. Yeah. Namely, I, I, uh, you know, uh, uh, wider side yard setbacks. No, I, I, I do want I, I do get in general what, what you're trying to do here and, and I think it's an interesting approach that that uh, certainly is a more modern approach and I I don't um, I I don't um, I can't say that I have a, a major um, a major um, fun, a fundamental objection to it um, I'm, I just want to make sure that I fully understand all the implications of adding this new analysis right. uh, to our dimensional requirements. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to spend some more time over the next week looking at the materials you've submitted. But sure. to the extent you can provide us with even more information to understand what this would actually mean with respect to what can and can't be built in, in sure. Arlington would be helpful. I'll do my best. Thank you. Thank you, David, and thank you, Ted. Uh, Jean. Thank you. Um, yeah, Ted, I had some of the same requests that Melissa and David had. I'm not really familiar with slide yard sky exposure planes, so this is my exposure to them. <laughs> so to the extent that uh, you can provide some of the things that Melissa and David talked about, that would be helpful. So. Yeah. Um, you mentioned a couple times that that what this is trying to get at is the impact of the new houses on their neighbors, the adjacent lots. And can you talk a little bit about what those impacts are that this would be addressing? The one you mentioned, the two you've mentioned is they're a lot taller than the house next door and your son looks out on a blank vinyl wall. Right. So, I wonder if there are other problems that this would address other than the height differential and what you look at next door. Well, I think it's, uh, you know, in 
you the big one the big impact uh is the height differential and um the massing of larger new homes um really up against the uh side, side yard setbacks um which causes the uh relative height impacts um those are the major impacts um but there's also um affiliated impacts with um um you know access to you know sunlight air whatnot um at least from what i've observed having lived for nine years next door to a 1600 square foot house that was about two stories um versus as i said a 5600 square foot house which is two and a half stories um our circulation from wind um is much different and in my opinion um less beneficial to us than it used to be um, again that's just my personal observation um but it's a perception that's real um and um you know we see less we have it's um detracted a bit from um our enjoyment if you will of the backyard vista uh, of our neighborhood um previously we could look out and from both sides and have an uninterrupted view of backyards uh which added to our enjoyment of a lot that is um disrupted um by the example i mentioned next door of a large modern new house uh, on a 6,000 square foot lot um so again those are tertiary to the main impact of the height differential and the shadows and um, restriction of sunlight and whatnot caused by that um but they are um they do affect us to some extent thanks that's helpful um a, a little tangent here have you ever heard of the doctrine of ancient lights i have not it was a um doctrine in england before the industrial revolution that said you basically couldn't build a structure that blocked the light on an adjoining structure and uh Eventually, the courts in England and all the courts in the United States, as a common law doctrine, basically repealed it because you couldn't have modern development if structures could never block the light on an adjoining structure. So what's been happening in the 21st century is not relooking at that doctrine, but saying, you know, there are some places that we should relook at it, like, you know, should we not allow um, a new structure to block a solar panel on an existing structure, mm -hmm. things like that. But yours is clearly a couple steps beyond that because if I understand it right, and tell me if I'm wrong, it's partially aesthetics for you. Mm -hmm. and uh, yes, it's partially that and partially, you know, airflow, sunlight, shadows. It, it, mm -hmm. For me, it's all of those wrapped into one. It's the total experience. So if the houses on both sides are already that big, let's say- Only one they, is. Pardon me? Only one on my side is that No, big. no, no, but let's say- Oh, okay. Let's okay. say it's, it's in a neighborhood where the house, the, you know, the abutting house is already two and a half stories high, then I'm guessing you wouldn't have the same objection to the middle lot being the same height as those other houses. Speaking hypothetically, I'd, I'd have to look at the situation and experience it. I can't. Yeah, because I'm thinking we might need an exception here when either the house, the abutting houses are, you know, a height that wouldn't be allowed under your sky plane or as Kim pointed out where the topography is such so that the house on one side is actually sitting higher than the house on the other side so you could actually build up so I'm thinking we would you know aside from the balconies that Melissa mentioned um, we might need to do something to take into account the neighboring houses and the topography. Um, I will um, note that um, 
besides the uh, exemptions I did mention, um, all the standard exemptions in section 5.3 of the zoning bylaw are also exempt from this kind of place, like chimneys, um, things, yeah, like that, I, things like that. Yeah, I assume, I assume that, yeah. But you added the roof mounted solar is something Correct. I noticed, yeah. which made sense. Yeah. So I'm thinking we may need to think about carving out some exceptions um, for the situations that I just mentioned. Um, Although I, I would, I, just to play devil's advocate, I, I might say that it would benefit everybody if you had three, you know, in a three example, three property example, if everybody was two and a half stories, if all of their heights were focused in the center of the lot rather than on the sides, they would all benefit from more airflow, sunlight, less shadows, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's um, probably correct, but yours would not let them get up to two and a half stories potentially. And that's sort of one of my problems. You'd, you'd, you don't want the giant next door, but you would be okay with the dwarf next door. And I don't think that's the right solution either. I think we have to figure out what to do with that. Um, well, and remember, this only applies to new construction. I, yeah, I understand. You understand. I understand. Um, do you have any idea if we put this into place, and I know it's only new construction, mm -hmm. how many existing houses in town would become, become non-conforming and that they wouldn't meet these sky plan requirements? Well, because it, it's new construction, it would really depend on the plans that come before. No, no, I, I, am, I understand that, but you know, if we change zoning in any way, things that are conforming become non-conforming. So I understand this would, you know, mm -hmm. not deal with things that were already built, but I'm just wondering how many homes that are currently conforming might become non-conforming as a result. I wonder. I I'd have to talk with the planning department. I don't have access to the town GIS to figure that out. Yeah, it would be interesting to know because that could have a real implication yep. um, down the road that would need to be considered. The other thing I wonder is if you've spoken with inspectional services about how easy or difficult it would be for them to actually implement this. In the, uh, in, I have uh, spoken in the past, I've spoken with, um, Commissioner Byrne, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he acknowledged that uh, right now they work with average grades, um, and he recommended that we key the um, calculation of the side yards to the average um, grade uh, calculation that's currently used. Um, we do realize that uh, there will be slightly higher costs for developers in getting a more complete survey of existing um, grades and actual, uh, you know, to calculate the average um, heights. Um, but uh, beyond that, it's a mathematical calculation, um, you know, once the uh, average grades are known. Do you anticipate it would be something that whomever was building the new house would do and not uh, yes. the inspectional services? Correct. Okay. That would be my recommendation on how to um, implement these and administer them. You know what uh, inspectional services thinks of that? Uh, commit, when I talked to Commissioner Byrne about two and a half years ago, he didn't think that would be a problem. Now, I don't know what he thinks now. I, I haven't talked to him since then. Okay, that's those are my questions for the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Uh, any other questions for uh, Ted Fields before we open this up for public comment? Ken. Yeah, Ted, um, under your exceptions, okay, uh, mm -hmm. where you say minor roof overhangs, it, I think it'd be better if you just clarified saying um, uh, roof, roof overhangs not to exceed two feet or something like that. Okay. Sim in a similar fashion how they did it in the design guidelines. Mm -hmm. And then same thing with uh, small dormers. Let's not say small dormers, say dormers that are one third of the roof or something. Similar way how they did it in the design guidelines. Well, it, it, they, I actually do spell that out more in the actual motion. Oh, you do? Yes. 
For uh, example, okay. roof, roof overhangs or eaves that extend horizontally no more than two feet. Excuse me. Um, it, it's section F. Uh, okay. That dormers that extend no more than five feet horizontally and five feet vertically. Okay. Sorry about that. I, 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 must, I must have missed over that. <laughs> it's a technical piece of motionery. Any other questions, Ken? No. Great, thanks. All right, uh, so at this point, we will open uh, Article 49 up for uh, public comment. Any member of the public wishing to speak, please use the raise hand function. Uh, we'll call on you in the order that the hands were raised. Please state your first, last name, and address, and you will be given up to three minutes to speak. The first speaker will be Carl Wagner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Carl Wagner, 30 Edgehill Road. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Thank you. Um, I think that Arlington has been already noted to be one of the towns that are adopting solar panels and other sustainable energy forms uh, among the highest in Massachusetts. And we're actually, in that regard, Massachusetts is, is leading the nation in many ways. Uh, likewise, uh, many other cities throughout the country and many other towns and cities in Massachusetts, I believe, already have protections for things like solar panels and other forms of alternative energy. And um, this is a really nice way to arrive at most of what those other towns protections would do, but those are uh, limited to those towns and just being solar protections. These go further. And as a longtime member of Sustainable Arlington, which, which deals not just with things like energy, but also with ways that we can have a, a lower impact on the planet and a sustainable community. Uh, I would say that Mr. Field's comments about uh, children looking through the windows or being able to sit in a backyard or being able to grow uh, plants and flowers and vegetables, these are not just, oh, la la kind of issues. These are important issues for our time where we're dealing with a planet that is heating up and where we have many neighbors who already have installed expensive panels that they would be very unhappy if they found out they were gonna be shaded, as well as if they found out that a huge place was going up. And going back to the earlier article on a moratorium for teardowns, we learned that between 800 or 3000 small houses are at risk of being torn down multiply that by two to three times for the number of properties that would be affected by huge mansions going up that would do just these things, ruin their solar panels, ruin the quality of life outdoors and the ability to plant. So I hope you'll uh, work with Mr. Field to make something that does go into place this town meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be uh, Winnell Evans. Thank you, Winnell Evans, Orchard Place. Um, I would like to speak in support of this article. I think it's a very elegant way to address a number of issues. And um, it particularly prods developers to think more creatively about massing, both in terms of designing the structure itself and in placing it on the site. Um, Right now, the average size of a new home built in Arlington is almost 1,000 square feet greater than the average size of new home construction in the United States. Um, I, I want to suggest that, you know, we're kind of getting into an area with really large houses uh, beyond what could be considered necessary to, to raise a family. So I think that um, keeping these new houses in better scale with their neighbors is going to be positive for neighbors and for neighborhoods. And I also just want to say very briefly, I noticed in the planning department's memo about this article that the, um, it states that the residential study group did not support it. I was a member of the group and I actually did support it at that time. It was one of the very few occasions when the residential study group did not reach consensus on an issue. Uh, so I just wanted to get that into the record. But, but overall, I think that this is a terrific approach with precedent, um, and I hope that the board will work to, to uh, make this happen. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Steve Revelak. 
Hello, Madam Chair, Steve Revelak, 111 Sunnyside Avenue. Uh, I submitted written comments uh, on this article and listening to the discussion, I realized that uh, there was one piece I omitted. So there is a section in our zoning bylaw. It is 542B2. That's 542B2, uh, which contains uh, some exemptions for, of side yard setback requirements for particular streets. And I just ask that uh, the board and Mr. Fields consider whether um, sky plane exposure should be uh, added to the exemptions in this section. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll uh, ask uh, Ted Fields, is that something that you have had a chance to, to take a look at? Are you familiar with that section? Is that something that... Uh, um, I'm not... Terribly, I've seen it before in passing, but uh, I'm not terribly familiar with it, but I'm happy to take a look and then take that under advisement. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions uh, for, for Ted from the board members on this article? I see David shaking his head no, Jean. Ted can, okay. Great, so um, it sounds like there were a few requests about some uh, clarifications about not overriding the side yard setbacks. Um, Mr. Revelak uh, had a good uh, question about the exemptions in 5.42.B2. And uh, there uh, was a request to look at exception neighboring houses due to topography. And I believe that the last item was a request for uh, imagery to, to see how this manifests itself in Cambridge or Needham and um, to potentially diagram over some of the property images that you had provided as, as reference for um, what the impact, uh, even a, a rough impact analysis might, might look like. Does that all seem- Less than a week. <laughs> Well, again, I think um, let's let's see what we can what what we can address and what we can't. Um, and I I think the ones that were specific to the technical details, if you're able to provide those, those those would be obviously the most important to 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 focus on. Rachel, let me just interject. In addition to the topography, it's just um, the idea that the if the houses if the abutting side yard houses are already two and a half stories high. I would want not want the sky plane um, to limit that the house in the middle to be smaller than it was. So I think you know it might be the smaller or the I'm not sure what the right wording is of either what you'd get from the side yard sky plane exposure or the abutting home, something like that, the height. So I'd like Ted to look at that too. Well, yeah, I, I've noted that. I'll I'll take a look. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, so we will now move on to uh, Article 44, which is zoning bylaw amendment related to parking minimums inserted by the request of James Fleming. Uh, James, are you with us? I see you right there. I am. Okay, so you'll have uh, three minutes to uh, present this warrant article to the board. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Rachel, can you go to the next slide, please? Or not Rachel, sorry. Um, Jenny, can you go to this? Thank you. Thanks, uh, James. Sorry. Fle okay, great. Yeah, I'm just going to ask you to introduce yourself and your yep. address. Uh, James Fleming, 58 Oxford Street. Um, thank you. This picture was taken a few weeks ago when the sign for the Heights pub went up over the old five and dime to great praise from local residents. Locals also remember how long it took to get approval and that it might not have happened at all. What was the problem? The store was built around 1970 before the current zoning bylaw and importantly, before minimum off street parking requirements. When five and time closed and the pub wanted to open, the pub was on the hook for adding parking to comply with the bylaw. Look at the building, where would you add parking? There's no room at the back and no one would spend money demolishing part of the business to add parking. The requirement just makes it harder to start a business so the storefront stays empty for longer. Next please. Luckily, the ZBA was able to make it work, so the pub is going in, and Article 20 passed in November, which allowed removing parking requirements in core business areas by special permit. Great, problem solved, right? Well, not really, because the same problem can happen elsewhere. Next, please. 
in Arlington Heights. Next. Near the high school. Next. In East Arlington. Next. And dozens of other small storefronts and offices around town. Next. This article would extend Article 20 to all the other business districts if the gross floor area of the business is under 6,500 square feet. Why 6,500? It's a small-ish number that includes most pedestrian storefronts and offices around town. Next. This proposal would not change anything about other districts on street or accessible parking. Next. Uh, I basically took the text of Article 20 and I rearranged it to support a list of situations that it applies in. You can see here that number one is just a rewritten version of Article 20 and number two is my addition. Next. The goals of the proposal are to one, make it easier to comply with parking requirements, obviously, which is why we're talking about this, um, but uh, also number two, which is to preserve the value of existing buildings. The next few slides I'll talk about there for a second. Uh, next, please. So here's an uh, example from the zoning bylaw, which describes the uh, amount of parking a business must provide. Um, I realized that the square footage number here is actually incorrect. The town corrected it. Um, I think it's about 250 square feet. Um, it, regardless, in some cases, a business has to provide parking nearly equal to the square foot of actual business they have. Next. To show the effect that this has, here's a comparison of two stores in town. On top is Walgreens in East Arlington and below is Regina's near the high school. According to town records, Regina's is worth a million dollars and Walgreens four times that. Sounds great. The problem is that Walgreens has a really big lot, but Regina's has a small lot. Walgreens pays 4x the tax revenue, but uses 18 times the land. Think about that. Regina's, built 100 years ago, provides more than four times the tax revenue for the land that it uses. It's a financial powerhouse, but you couldn't build it today because of parking minimums. Based on its value, we should want more places like Regina's in town. Next. In summary, this article would let special permit authorities remove parking requirements in all business districts if creating new parking is impractical or, or, or unnecessary, depending on zoning and floor area like talked about previously. You should support this because the requirements make it hard to reuse some buildings and because businesses, businesses which actually meet the requirements are less valuable than they could be. Thank you. Thank you. I will uh, now open this up to the board for comment. Jean? Um, thank you. Uh, can you put on the screen the actual um, um, proposed motion? Thank you. Is it, um, is it one of these, um, you, you know, I'm not- up, You had it up a moment ago. Jim. It was in one of the slides. Oh, in the slide. Okay, thank it, you. It, it's in a couple places, but- it's, There we go. Okay. There, we go. there you go. Um, I, so may exercise this capability is not, sort of legal language for bylaws, James. I don't know okay. if you ran this by town council, but you could say may implement this if, but I would prefer to, to not cross out in B3 and B5, but insert the other in. If you don't mind, I could email you afterward with a proposed way to- That, that, to that sounds fine. Include what? those in a- a slightly different way that I think might be better. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I ran this by um, the planning department, um, but I didn't end up running the final motion by town council. Mm -hmm. um, as long as the substance is the same, I'm the wording. Yeah, let let me just, me. yeah, let me just sort of run an alternative by you, and I'll also run it by the planning department. Also, is a, a slightly different way um, to word it. The the only other comment I had, and you know, you came before us before you put this in. So we had the benefit of, of that conversation at one of our meetings some time ago. So at the time, I didn't know about this 6,500 square foot piece. And you did mention that it's most of the 
um, business properties in town. Do you know which ones are not would not be subject to it? Um, I don't have a. I'm based on what the town had provided. I'm sure my list is now incomplete. In one of the uh, one of the supporting documents, there was a, there was a table of properties which were listed by gross floor area, which I realize is not perfect because there are some of those properties are subdivided into different businesses. Right. Um, the they're sorted by building area and square footage. So if you were to go down yeah. um, to the, down the list to where sixty you see sixty five hundred. Um, you could see some of the ones that are over that um, that limit. And I, I'm not married to that particular number. It was just a number that seemed to pull in most pedestrian storefronts in town. Yeah, I just, um, I'll, I'd like to hear what my other colleagues on the board say about what I'm going to say, which is, it seems like a fine number to me, but let's say that there are a couple storefronts at that size or, you know, two thirds of the size and, they don't have any parking and then some business comes in and wants to knock down the wall and all of a sudden you have a you know 12,000 square foot restaurant bar whatever you know brew pub or whatever and there's no parking available for it so i'm just wondering that's a good point and I'll, I'll just hear what the other members of the board say i'm just yeah, wondering yeah if we should be okay with the 6,500 and say the chance that something else will happen is very remote, or should we try to deal with that here? That's it. No, that, that's a really good point. Thank you, Jean. Uh, next, I'll go to David. Thank you, Rachel. And uh, hello again, James. Hello. Uh, so, um, other than the the 6,500 um, number um, that's in there now, what uh, has anything else changed? What's changed from what you talked to us about when you appeared before us previously? Sure. So the original the original proposal was to completely eliminate parking minimums altogether, and it was made mm -hmm. extremely clear that that was not going to fly in a single session of town meeting or even make it by the ARB. So I scaled it back to what you see before you. Okay. Um, I, I appreciate that. And I think this, this is uh, pretty well tailored and is in line with um, the incremental relaxation of, of parking requirements that we've been engaged in for a few years. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, I, I, share Jean's concern about the 6,500 square feet because it just seems a little bit arbitrary. It is, absolutely. Uh, and, and I'm just, I, I'm not sure I understand all of the potential implications of that. And as Jean pointed out, um, uh, one situation that, that, uh, that this could cause a problem. So um, I, I'd encourage you to think about that a little bit um, and um, maybe work with us to, to come up with a, a way of um, being more flexible uh, in the event of an unanticipated situation. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, David. And, and I'll just ask before I move to, to Ken and, and Melissa, whether, you know, I, I agree that it, it, it does seem like an arbitrary number, um, given that it is like the, we put no restriction on the size when it came to the B3 or B5 district, I would ask the question to the other board members, is there any risk, should we put a square footage requirement in for the, for the other districts at all, given that this is one of, of many different relief options, but it is not the default relief option that is that is given to us to to potentially exercise. So um, I'll, I'll throw that out there. I'd, I'd maybe throw it back to James uh, to answer that question of why why he thought there should be a, uh, a limitation. There, James. Sure. So the only reason really to have a limitation on square foot was incremental incrementalism doing it as small a scope as possible. If you think it'd be better to not have that number and just make it say any, you can do this 
in any business district, regardless of floor area, I'm totally on board with that. Can, can we ask the staff if, if they think the 6,500 would end up being a problem, you know, in terms of businesses and buildings in town? Jenny? But honestly, I would have to study that a little bit more carefully. Um, I had not thought of it and how it might apply to uh, development and, and also looking more carefully at that supporting uh, document that was provided to see how that might impact, um, you know, just sort of more broadly. So I would need to look at it a little bit more carefully. Jean. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ken, I'll go to you next. Um, well, I would agree with you, Rachel. I would push to not having a, a square footage there altogether. Uh, I think the, the market will be what it is. And the fact that it's all the, sh all the shops are so cut up that, you know, there's not going to be a 30, 40,000 square foot uh, <laughs> um, place that opens up. Uh, it, it just won't, the market won't allow that. And, you know, and there won't be enough parking and it won't, it won't happen. I think, you know, it's going to be mostly around eight to 10,000 at most. But I think eliminating is the way to go. I think uh, if you haven't changed anything from what we talked about before, I'm perfectly fine with everything you have right now. Besides that, you know, eliminating the square footage altogether. Great, thank you, Ken. Uh, Melissa, questions or comments? Mm. Um, I think generally speaking, I. I, I, I'm leaning towards, you know, no minimum on the uh, square footage. Um, in my experience, you know, those businesses that are coming in understand the context, the financing on certain businesses also kind of, um, kind of look to the surrounding areas on what's allowed, what's not in terms of, you know, new tenants in this space um, and why it may or may not be viable. Um, and so I think if I'm understanding it, removing the square footage offers the most flexibility for being able to use this, correct? Um, and so that's kind of how I, I would lean towards that. Especially, you know, if we can look to, you know, I think existing on-street infrastructure for parking and things like that. So that's where I am right now. Great, thank you, Melissa. Any other uh, questions or comments from the board before I open this up for public comment? David. Well, I just with respect to Jean's thoughts on uh, on rewriting this a little bit, um, if if we uh, keep uh, uh, some language in there that this is discretionary, not required, then uh, just eliminating the 6,500 uh, square foot number uh, just allows us to exercise discretion. Uh, and if somebody were to pro propose a 30,000 square foot uh, project with, with no parking, then uh, we presumably wouldn't, wouldn't exercise our discretion in that case. Well, I mean, not only is it discretionary, but we can only exercise the discretion in the circumstances in which there's no on-site parking available and we make the determination that there's adequate offsite parking available. So right. we don't have unlimited discretion. We still right. have to meet those requirements. Yeah. Great. Any other questions or comments before I open this up for public comment? Okay. Uh, so any member of the public who wishes to speak on this topic, please use the raise hand function in the participant section, and I'll call on you in the order that hands are raised. I'll give it another minute or two. Okay, I see uh, no members of the public wishing to speak. Uh, James, did you have any uh, further questions for the board? It sounds like uh, Jean will be reaching out to you with some um, with a proposed change to the, some of the article language. 
And um, you've certainly heard from, from the board that there are a number of us who uh, would be in favor of removing the 6,500 square footage uh, reference. Which makes it very easy to rewrite in those circumstances. I'm, I'm, I'm a fan, let's do it. Okay. Fantastic, thank you so much for bringing this in front of us. Thank you. All right, so we will uh, now move to Article 37, uh, which is the Zoning Bylaw Amendment for Multifamily Zoning for MBTA Communities. And uh, I will turn this over to, uh, to Jenny, um, but before I do so, I'll just remind everyone that this is, uh, this was, uh, discussed by the board and we had previously identified that this was um, an article that we did not have an intent to continue to um, to support moving forward at this time but I'll turn it over to Jenny yeah I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I'm not sure that I have much more to say than what you just stated um, okay. so I don't want I don't want to repeat you but I will say that the the memo we provided also explained that, you know, I, I think if there had been at least some guidance from the state that we could maybe at least assess or understand or anything, um, we might be in a different place right now, but even, you know, we don't have that, we don't have any other information to go on. So I would continue to encourage the board to, uh, you know, vote no action essentially to, to take this out of the loop of, of town meeting and, and anybody's, uh, frankly, any concerns that people are having about it or just to, to put it to the side for now. Um, and we'll come back to it when we have information from the state and guidance to work with uh, in the future and with the community and a process to then bring it forward to a future town meeting. That would be my recommendation at this point. Great, thank you, Jenny. And I'll just run through the board for, for any questions or comments, Jean. I agree with Jenny's recommendation. Great, uh, Kim? Yes, same here. David? Yes, no further comments. Melissa? No further comments. Great. So I will uh, open this up <coughs> for any questions or comments. Uh, please use the raise hand function in the participant section of Zoom. Okay, seeing none, we will. Uh, we will end public comment on that particular article. And that brings us to the uh, end of tonight's warrant article reviews. Um, so I would like to see if there is a motion to continue the open public hearing to the next scheduled date, which is Monday, April 5th. So moved. Second. Roll call vote. Any discussion? All right, so I'll go through the roll call vote. Ken? Yes. David? Yes. Dean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And I am a yes as well. So we will continue uh, this public hearing to April 5th. Thank you, everyone. Okay, the next uh, item on our agenda is docket uh, 2150, which is a continued public hearing for 49 to 51 Grove Street. Do we have the applicants with us this evening? We do, we have the architect and we have the director of the Department of Public Works. Fantastic, is there someone who would like to uh, speak to the uh, revisions on the supplemental material that was submitted uh, for the continued hearing. Uh, good evening. My name is Jeff Alberti from Weston and Sampson, and uh, I'm happy to speak on behalf of the DPW on this project and walk you through the comments that were brought up at the last meeting and uh, our responses. <laughs> and also with me is David Steves, who's our architect on the project. And uh, out of respect for your time, I know you guys have already had a long evening. I'll try to quickly go through uh, the comments and the responses and then open it up to questions so we can get right to that if that works. Perfect. Thank you so much. And thank you for bearing with us uh, so late in the evening. I appreciate it. Oh, no, no worries at all. I got a lot of work done waiting. So thank you. <laughs> um, so this is, uh, as you said, a continued hearing from the last meeting. And at the last meeting, we identified uh, five comments. And I just wanted to briefly outline them, describe, I know you've read it, so I'll just quickly go through our response and uh, happy to answer any questions. The first uh, comment had to do with the 
bicycle rack that we were proposing, we had indicated a wave bicycle rack at the last meeting. And based on the meeting, it was suggested uh, that we take a closer look at the Arlington bicycle parking guidelines. Specifically, it started on page 12, where we started to uh, see the information that we needed to address. Uh, we made a modification for a hoop inverted U type bike rack, uh, which is properly spaced, provides two points of contact for the bicycle uh, and allows the bikes to be securely locked. So that change has been made and we've provided a sketch SKC-1 in our packet that uh, shows that uh, inverted U bike rack. Uh, comment two was the uh, Arlington Redevelopment Board requested that uh, one of the parking spaces along Grove Street be changed to a handicapped parking spot. So we met with our civil site team and worked through the ADA accessibility requirements and determined that uh, in order to properly locate that spot, we would need a five foot width aisle adjacent to the parking spot that would have to be on the same plane. So down at the street level. And when we looked at trying to lay that space out, that would leave us with less than two feet of a side, two foot sidewalk, which was not sufficient. We reviewed the potential shifting of the overall building and how it lays out on the site, but due to operational impacts, we were unable to make any changes. So therefore that uh, potential for an accessible spot in front of the building uh, would not work. But as we showed in the earlier plan, we do have one that's immediately as you enter the site. Uh, comment number three was a, uh, request to look at the location of the interior bicycle parking. We've provided a plan in our documents and we can certainly go to it if there's more questions that show the location of that bicycle rack. Uh, it's located immediately adjacent to an exterior door. It's separate from the main uh, access point where we're gonna have potentially a lot of pedestrians entering and exiting the building. So it provides a nice secure access for anyone that does come to the site with the bike. They can store that indoors and they have direct access from that corridor to the locker shower toilet facilities. That was comment number three. Comment number four had to do with just providing some additional information on the signage. We've provided the details for the monument sign, building sign and canopy sign, indicating along with the details, uh, the requirements that are being met, showing that we meet the zoning bylaws with regards to the signage. And then comment number five, uh, I don't want to oversimplify this, and certainly David Steves can talk more about this, but we did provide, uh, we took a closer look at, at the request of the redevelopment board, we took a closer look at the massing to see if we could use features that could potentially create some vertical bays along the facade. And we we're able to come up with a, a series of studies looking at the use of different panel profiles and different colors to help introduce vertical elements to mitigate the horizontal and linear quality of the front elevation and to emulate some of those sequences of building bays. And we provided uh, those elevations within our documents and we can certainly get into those in more details if you have questions. So again, uh, understanding you've had a long, e long evening, I'll open it back up to you for questions and we can address any of the details. Great, thank you very much. I appreciate um, your attentiveness to all of the, the questions. Uh, I will start with Ken. Hey, Jenny, can you go to, uh, there's like, I don't know, five elevations uh, they, they submitted of, e, uh, of the e-building. Yep, right there. Which one are you uh, proposing? So, uh, uh, Go ahead, Dave. Well, this is, we started with the what was presented uh, to the board at the last meeting, which is the, our starting point, which shows the terracotta tile, uh, rain screen wall uh, panel. And the comments were that it was a strong horizontal element and it would be um, behoove us to look at possibly breaking up the horizontal nature with some vertical elements uh, to more emulate the existing historical buildings uh, on the site, if I understood that correctly. So that's where we started. And then so we just essentially walked through a series of studies of how we arrived to the final slide of the elevation. So we started adding some accent panels where we had um, some accent tiled between the all of the window bays. And that was just 
too busy, didn't have a, a very regular rhythm or sequence. So uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Yes, thank you right there, That's perfect. So uh, we looked at removing every other bay to, to, uh, or every other horizontal to try to get a, a regular larger bay spacing and kind of keeping with the overall and proportion to the length and height that the bays kind of uh, would work in that massing to try to capture the window elements um, because the windows are not regular like the historical buildings. So we tried to make the bays regular um, to emulate that while the windows could kind of float within these bay type elements. And then so we looked at it even further. If you could go to the next slide, please. Great, thank you. We added again, just to uh, continue the consistent vertical elements, we um, added them to the end bays adjacent to the two story uh, glass elements on the corners. And we added some horizontal banding to try to define these very clear punched, delineated uh, bay segments uh, in, in the patterning of the facade. Um, if you could go to the next slide. Um, and this shows how we reduced the, uh, the ends as kind of a detail that we, the ends were wider and heavier on the overall building um, massing. So we reduced the, the end bay elements of the accent tile to be consistent with the vertical elements in the middle body of the building. Try to make them again, more consistent and regular. If you could go to the next slide. Please. Uh, and here, then we wanted to continue not just in the uh, terracotta field, but also bring that down into the faceted storefront wall by uh, articulating some of the spandrel glass uh, would have an accent color that would continue that, uh, that vertical characteristic of defining those bays. So it would extend really from the ground plane through the entire facade. And this is the, uh, the final proposed elevation. And we, we're showing uh, some examples you can see in the lower left hand corner of the standard flat tire tile uh, and then the accent um, pilaster tile. Those are actually the same color, but you get some differentiation by the profile uh, and having it as a different profile. Um, and so we're looking at this type of um, execution and articulation on the facade. And here's just, it shows it that we would continue it around the side elevations um, for this front two-story admin uh, volume of the building. So it would continue just at that two-story admin portion. It's consistently from the front facade to the side elevations. So sorry for so many, but we wanted to kind of show our process a little bit, how we tried to articulate the material that we're using, uh, the rain screen wall system for the facade and how it can be articulated to emulate the, the bay characteristics of the historic buildings. Well, I appreciate your, uh, your efforts in this. I think <clears throat> this is a lot better than what you had before. Uh, can I make a few small suggestions and take it as, I'll let, I'll let you take it as you want. Uh, I would probably emphasize the entry uh, a little bit more. So if you look at the entry right now, you have a, a complete vertical pilaster on the right-hand side. Yep. I would mimic that on the left-hand side and the bandage you have going across the, the entry, I would stop it uh, at the new pilaster on the left-hand side so it gives it a little more emphasis on the entry because otherwise it looks, <clears throat> the entry doesn't look as well emphasized. And then I may even uh, raise the parapet on the roof, just in that area between the two, uh, between the two pilasters, just so it, it signifies this entry to the building. Similar to the building job next door, has the same kind of characteristics of the verticalities and emphasizing the entry you know, using different materials and different proportions, but it's still the same kind of uh, attitude. Okay. Uh, that's, I don't know, I'll see what the other people said. 
other uh, board members say, but everything else looks fine to me. Great, thank you, Ken. I'll go to uh, Jean next. I'm gonna to defer to people with a better eye for aesthetic building detail than I have to discuss um, this piece of it. Um, I had a couple other questions, one which hadn't come up. Last time I asked about solar and you said the roofs were gonna be solar ready, but you might actually be ready to put solar on them. Can you just give me an update on where that is in the process? Uh, no change from last time that currently the scope of the project is focused on just being solar ready. So providing the, the structure for the capacity of future solar panels, as well as the uh, place inside for them to locate equipment, as well as having penetrations uh, pre-installed for uh, roof tightness. So that's generally where the project stands at this point. And how much of the roof will be available for solar? Is it the entire roof? Uh, the entire rear portion, the the um, the front portion is not, but the entire rear portion, it's it's got to be. David, maybe you can help me out with the overall square footage, somewhere in the thirty thousand square foot range. Is it yeah, more than over, half over 20, 25,000 square feet? Is it more than half the square footage of the room? Oh yeah. Yes. Okay, thanks. The the um the really only other comment I had was about the parking spaces in front. I was the person I think who raised the issue to ask if you if it could be handicap accessible. And I did read your explanation and heard you say it wasn't. I I had said that if it wasn't handicapped accessible because it didn't meet the zoning bylaw requirements, I'd have a hard time approving it. And I just was thinking with all of the parking you have around the side. How really necessary is it for you to have those three parking spaces in front? It, one of the primary drivers for it was uh, safety, trying to allow folks that are coming to the site to conduct uh, quick business with the building department and DPW administration to be able to pull off the street and quickly conduct business and then exit without having to enter into the yard area. So. From an operational perspective, we thought that would be very important. And also, uh, there are a lot of uh, people that drop off students that happen to walk over to the high school on this road. And this would help to keep them from entering the site for drop off. So we do You're think from a, just a like a drop off thing and not an actual parking. Um, yeah, that that's obviously um, an option we could definitely look at. I know okay. that the parking is you know, we were at our minimum uh, for parking. So uh, that's certainly something that we could take a look at. Uh, you know, I'll hear what my colleagues have to say, but I'd be much more comfortable with it as a drop off rather than a parking space because technically, you know, as, as has been pointed out, it's, in, it's inconsistent with the parking requirements because it's located within the front yard of the building. So I'll hear what my colleagues have to say about that. Thank you, that's it. I, I, if, I might, if I might add, I just, uh, the, there is parking uh, along the street in certain areas here. We were just trying to pull that off to make it a little bit easier for that to happen. Understood, I think the problem was by making it easier, you also ran into the zoning bylaw. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Dean. Uh, let's see, uh, David. Uh, so I, I think, um, I don't feel strongly one way or the other, uh, about, about the parking. Uh, I, I, I could go either way on it. Um, I had hoped that there could, uh, be a handicapped accessible space there, but I understand, uh, the analysis for why that, that won't work. Um, I uh, just want to say I appreciate uh, the changes to the bike parking and uh, having seen the, the diagram now of how the flow would work for people entering the building with their bikes and then uh, going deeper into the building, um, I, I think that that's workable. So I have no further comments on that. 
and uh, I will defer to my colleagues on the aesthetics of the front facade. Great, thanks, David. So I'll um, also add that I, I have no specific um, I issue with the with the parking um, in in front of the the building as it is, but um, you know I'll, I'll ask Ken to weigh in on that as well. Um, I just have two questions about the uh, changes to the facade. Jenny, if you could go to what is sheet seven of eight, the one with the um, imagery, the um, precedent imagery. And my questions are, um, the first, first of all, just to confirm, um, your intent is that the, the two different um, profiles would be the same color, cor correct? That is our intent. Um, th they don't have to be, but we, by talking to the rep, that is the most economical, um, but the most common, uh, one of the most common advantages of using this material by keeping it the same dimension um, and, you, and, and um, no, I, altering I just it the same color with the different. So that's, that's great. I just wanted to confirm. Yep. Yeah, that was your intent as well. And then my other question is, I see in the precedent image um, where they typically change, um, where they typically change the profile, they also change the plane. So, um, you know, there there is a, an area that is, you know, there's a small shadow line in that as well. Is that your intent here as well, where you have the vertical elements that, that also sits proud of the, um, of the, facade for for the other profile? Uh, that is something that we were looking at and considering, but that was not our intent. Our intent was really to try to, you know, keep it as simple as we could and not add additional costs to the to the project. Um, we did look into that and, and talk to the manufacturer on what's involved with creating that um, that recess. And uh, we decided that it really is not going to give us the, the bang for the buck. It's not going to really give us a lot more of the articulation that we're looking for with, um, with that small change. So our intent is to keep it all on the same plane and modify the, the profile to give us the accent uh, and the bay patterning. Sure. I, I think the shadow line do, does add quite a bit, but I also understand um, the the cost implications. Um, if, if it's possible, I'd love to see it. If not, it's certainly not the end of the world. Um, but I, I appreciate you taking a look at that. And I think just from the imagery on the on the right, you can certainly see where there is that that shadow line there, there is a little bit more depth yep. to the board articulation. Um, but I'm, I'm satisfied too with um, also some of the um, the uh, Feedback that, that Ken gave you as well. Um, Ken, were those items that you wanted them just to, to, to study, but that would not hold up any approval this evening? What are what are your thoughts on the um, the specific feedback that you gave on the facade? Well, I would like them to emphasize entry a lot more, but if but I was gonna um, if the rest of the board says no. You're being too picky. Um, I would say I would, you know, say okay, but I would like to push for that. Uh, I don't think it's going to add that much more cost than just um, changing the um, the way the material looks. You know, just having that one pilaster there and deleting that one window is that window going to interfere with a uh, space inside? Uh, no, that's a um, larger window directly over so the entry you're looking at it in, in just a flat elevation but it it does project from the facade it has a, a an entrance canopy uh, so the entry itself the vestibule projects and then there's also a canopy on top of that correct um, so it does punctuate and and it does have signage over the canopy and that was very similar you're voicing the concerns that we've had as well that we tried to express in the design by uh, identifying the entry. Um, that larger window is directly over that main entrance vestibule, but it goes in, you can see it's spandrel glass. It's a typical window, but it has spandrel glass elements 
again, to kind of make that a larger and more um, punctuated at the entry end of the building. Um, yes, the, you, you lose me a little bit there because it's not quite centered. It feels like it's um, um, a mistake. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't. That's okay. You, yeah, you can, I see what you're saying. Uh, we can... Um, if you if yeah. you made it centered by a couple inches, that's all, uh, or a foot or something. I mean, that's all. Uh, uh, make it good or bad, you know. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Yes, I do. Yep. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I don't know. Richard, I don't disagree. Your question. I would. Yeah, I would like to have it because this is a public building that's going to be there for a while. It, it represents Arlington, you know, yep. and you know, I, I would like to have it, you know, at least at the entry spend a little more money there and a little more detailing there to make it look nicer, you know? Would it be okay for us to, to if we got approval tonight to then just have submit supplemental information to the board for your information and um, to, just to keep you apprised of the development of the design? Yes, I, I would be fine with that just because the fact that you, bet, you guys have been so responsive to all the other comments that um, I have no problem with that. And, uh, you know. Okay. I feel similarly. Um, and as far as the drop off loop, uh, I can go either way. I'll, I'll just make a pitch that I think we should have a drop off and not parking because, you know, if you look at the bylaw, it says they can't have parking in the front yard, which is what it is, which the staff identified to us in the initial um, memorandum. And I'd be more sympathetic to it if it was something where it was absolutely necessary for the facility, but it sounds like it's not. And having it as a drop-off area would solve some of the issues that uh, Mr. Rademacher mentioned. So. A drop-off area to me is a nice compromise. I'll be okay with that, Eugene. Okay, any other, I'm gonna open this up for public comment unless there are any other questions or, or comments and then we can um, talk to any of the final uh, special conditions afterwards. Okay. Uh, so I will now open uh, this up for public comment. Any member of the public wishing to speak on this docket number, please use the raise hand function in the participant section. Seeing none, we will now close public comment. Um, so let's see, we have a couple of, of items to, to note for revisions, but I don't know that these necessarily need to be um, special conditions, but Jenny, correct? Because they're, they're really just items that need to be um, revised and um, ensured that they are, are, are followed through, but they're not necessarily special conditions. Yeah, usually we would just handle these as administrative review by the department and I will deem whether or not they would need to come back to the board based upon what I'm reviewing. The scale or scope, you know, if it's well beyond what you've suggested um, or I think it triggers additional review. So the, the first then is the, um, the change of the, um, the parallel parking in front of the building to be a drop-off zone. I'm just making notes as I go. And then the second is uh, to further study the, uh, the, the entrance per uh, Kim Lau's uh, comments earlier this with, week. With the first one, are you talking about, how that, uh, while it is related to this building, that technically is in the town right of way. Is that, is that accurate, Mike? Um, I, you know, if, I, if the, I'm not sure if the property line is shown on there. I thought it was within the right of way. Um, Jeff or David? Let me see if I can get my plan in front of me. Erin has her hand up. Hand up. Erin. Uh, uh, on the plan in the original <clears throat> submission, it looks like it's kind of half and half. It, the parking spaces straddle the property line. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't have that plan 
like available at this exact minute. But so it's it's what you have up here on the screen. It's just Jenny. basically this, right? But I mean, is this so? But what what you're talking about, I think, has some public right of way implication and is beyond the. I mean, it's certainly something that we could include as a special condition that we would like them to consider that um, and work with uh, essentially um, the police department and probably the select board um, as well as their own engineering division um, on uh, the siting of those, um, of this uh, requirement, you know, for additional parking out front. But I, I don't think that we can go much further than that. Well, if they, if, then we couldn't have approved it as parking either. Is that what you're saying? It couldn't have been approved as parking. No, I had I had been kind of confused by that comment. Um, but no, because I, I think it's straddling both the public right of way and yes, to some extent, a little bit within their property line. But yeah, I, I was assuming it was all on their property line. So sorry about. That. And and please, David or Jeff or Aaron, uh, if there's something I'm missing here, let me know. But I, I believe that it's. A little bit of both. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So then I don't think that that could be, you know, beyond what I've explained, I don't think you could go much further than that. But it, but we can't allow it as parking either. No. Right. Okay. No. So that just needs to be eliminated, the recess. Okay. I mean, they, they could work on it, kind of similar to when we were talking, you know, we've had other cases where we talk about parking that's sort of related to the project, but we can't make it a requirement sure. um, that we would like them to explore it or go through a process with the select board or transportation, you know, or, you know, other committees essentially um, to have an additional review, but we can't go much further than that. Great. So let's um, include that as, as the special condition then to review um, the desired recessed par parking area with the appropriate town committees except that since part of it's in their front yard i think that over that part we can say it doesn't meet the requirements of the zoning code but i'd be okay with it as a drop-off area if it weren't in the front yard as jenny i would agree with jenny we don't have any say over it at all Except for the uh, the mention of uh, parents dropping students off at that location, I, I don't understand why a drop off area even makes sense there at this facility. Well, that's the, one of the major reasons. I know it's uh, a very tight street, and uh, if anybody parks there, you know you're it's two way traffic. It's very tight. We, we work very hard to um, keep, to make it so that, because there is a significant high school drop-off population here and we were trying to make it so they wouldn't have to come through a, you know, an active DPW site to do that. There's also very quick turnaround um, drop-off of building permits there. Um, for the uh, inspectional services. So um, we were saw it as a benefit too for contractors to be able to um, come to the site and um, do their business during the day. Uh, my suggestion would be that we handle this by just talking about what's happening at the curb line. Anything about parking though, it feels unrelated to the conditions of the permit. Um, I mean, of course that could be the purpose for adjusting the curb line, but I don't know that we have control over whether or not they can put a, you know, they cannot, we, we don't have control over putting a sign out that says this is drop off only, this is limited period of time, those sorts of details. We're getting a little bit beyond ourselves here. So the condition would be to work with the appropriate town committees um, for the proposed curb line recess period, the end, and leave it at that. Great. Any objections to that proposed language? Okay, uh, any, other, uh, uh, any other special conditions or items for further review with the planning department staff uh, that any of the board members would like to discuss? I just, I don't, it's not special conditions or things for the 
the um, applicants, but just, I think we need to make two or three findings in, that I didn't see. One was that we're okaying the driveway being 30 feet wide because of DW equipment and fire department equipment. And um, then there are a couple others that Jenny had also identified in her initial memo that just should be findings by us in the special permit. Jenny, do you have a, a list of those or do you need us to enumerate those? No, it's from, um, he, uh, Gene is referencing the original memo right. and he's just right. added one additional one, which I think makes sense. Okay, great. Uh, so is there a uh, motion to, sorry, let me get back to my agenda so I can get the right number here. Is there a uh, motion to approve docket 2150 um, with the special- it's, um, it's just, it's as amended by docket 2618. Thank you. I didn't say the whole thing. I appreciate that, Jenny. <laughs> Uh, as amended by docket 2618 uh, with the special conditions as previously stated to work with the appropriate town committee for proposed curbline recess. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Great, I will take a roll call vote and- um, Melissa... Richard, you'd include the entry uh, comments, right? Yes, so the, that, um, that was uh, specifically to be worked through together with the uh, planning department, but that would not be um, a special condition. Okay. Agree, Jenny? Agree. Okay, great. Any other uh, discussion or uh, comment before we move to a vote? Great, and I'll just note that uh, Melissa was not a member of the board when this uh, was open, so she will not be voting this evening. Uh, so we'll take a roll call vote. Ken? Yes. David? Yes. Dean? Yes. And I am a yes as well. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. For all your comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now go build it. I know. <laughs> yeah. That's the easy part. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we will now move to agenda item number three, which is uh, meeting minutes. And first, the meeting minutes of January 4th, 2021. And I'll run through roll call to see if anyone has any uh, additions or corrections, starting with Ken. Nope. David? Uh, yes. Uh, bottom of page four. Uh, there's a sentence that's in the middle of the paragraph there. Mr. Watson says he feels that the 12 week period to prepare zoning articles is not enough time and to have it, um, it doesn't, that sentence doesn't make great sense. Uh, I, I think it should say to prepare zoning articles is not enough time. Uh, maybe a uh, a special comma, especially, uh, uh, for, uh, citizen proposals. And it has not been an optimal process. I think that's maybe, that maybe makes more sense. Sorry. I, um, especially, especially for citizen proposals. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Comma, and it has not been an optimal process. Yeah, so it's, it's already there. Oh, I see. That is long. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else, David? No, that was it on that one. Okay, Gene? I have a few on page one. The paragraph starts with the chair closed. Um, 
It's, it's one sentence that says Ms. Rate suggested that the board follow the signed bylaw recommendations. There should be another sentence after that that says Mr. Benson agreed. Before Mr. Lau moved, you were on the right thing. Mr. Benson agreed. Thank you. On the next page, page two. Um, the next to last paragraph, the one that starts with Mr. Watson asked, um, the next to last sentence it say, where it says, the financial payback, it should say will be good, not the financial payback good. Down, 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 down. Financial payback will be good. You see where I am? That's it. Okay, on the next page, um, the first paragraph, the next to last sentence, Mr. Benson said that it should say, if Ms. Thornton, then the last paragraph on that page, there's a, where it says the town's 100 year old, you don't need the O with the old. And um, where it has same paragraph, so go back. Um, where, regarding zoning, getting, Mr. Revelak addressed Ms. Lowe's question regarding going, getting in the way, the word in needs to be added. And there needs to be a period after the word home there to end the sentence. Okay, and um, on the next page, the paragraph that starts with Joanne Preston, after the word from, you don't, you should, no, no, back. After the word from, delete the word is, third line. The paragraph right above that, Philip Tedesco, it should say agrees on taking, not and taking. Should be on taking a more critical look. One paragraph, one sentence up. Right, and down the, the last paragraph on that, the same one we made the change for David at the bottom. Um, oh, you move that around. Um, there's a word, let me find it now, that says comfortable and should be comfortably. And on the last page, the, 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 that paragraph that you're on, the third line from the bottom, the word can needs to be after the word petitioners and not before the word petitioners. Great, that's it. Great, thank you. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes as amended? So moved. A second. second. All right. Uh, we'll take a roll call vote. Ken? Yes. David? Yes. Dean? Yes. I am a yes as well. Minutes are approved for the January 4th, 2021 meeting. We'll now move to the January 25th, 2021 meeting. And uh, we'll start with Ken for any corrections or changes. On page one, it says, uh, Mr. Al said he also takes exception to Mr. Laredi's remarks. Uh, Mr. Lau said that all meetings have been held uh, in the open. I, I, think, I don't think the word open is, is correct there. We should say, uh, uh, help, 
What's a good word there, Gene? I thought it was fine. Oh, really? <laughs> I mean, you, you could just say have been open meetings. That's okay. even better. Yeah, okay. I, I think held in is in the. I thought it meant held in the open, like, you know, outside or something. Outside. <laughs> like in a park somewhere, huh? Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's it. Uh, David? Uh, top of page four. Uh, the sentence that says Mr. Watson asked Mr. Fleming uh, if he would like to present. Uh, something big to spark discussion or something carefully tailored that will be more easily passed. Can we just say it will more easily pass? Sure, that works too. It's less passive. <laughs> That was it. Okay, thank you. Jean? Okay, on the first page, the one about the fourth or fifth paragraph down, the one that starts Mr. Benson. There we go. Mr. Benson said that ex parte communications may be improper communications. Two words, maybe. But, but not all ex parte communications by the board are improper. Okay, then down on the next um, sentence, back, um, where, where are you at a second? Oh, if that the next to last line, it should be if there were extenuating circumstances. Next to the last line from the bottom of the page. Oh, okay. If there were extenuating circumstances. On the next page. It said it's about halfway down. It says, um, Mr. Benson asked why. No, that's not the one. Where is it? Mr. Benson asked if the parcel change. It should say not say next to the DPW changes, but needed for the DPW permit. No, you went too far. Um. Oh, I'm sorry. That's I'm on page two. Uh, oh, it's near the top. It, yeah, it's over here. Um, yeah, to the DPW. Right. Okay. No. And it's just where it says Mr. Benson asked if the parcel change. The word after yeah. change shouldn't be next. It should be needed for the DPW changes. Okay. Okay. And then um, well, the other one we can just it's too much. And that's too much. And here's one I didn't understand on the third page. I didn't understand this sentence at all, where it says, Mr. Benson said the small locks as Mr. Revelack mentioned in the proposed overlay district is an advantage would be a challenge to craft. I don't understand that sentence. Could we delete it? I don't know. You said it. No, <laughs> no, no. Somebody transcribed <laughs> it. Can we delete Sorry. that sentence? <laughs> I don't know what it means. <laughs> it says you said it. Well, you want me to tell you what I think I said? <laughs> yes, that would be preferred. I think, I, think I said, Something like, uh, Mr. Benson said the small lots Mr. Radelak mentioned the pro overlay district 
are an advantage and would be a challenge to craft a bylaw amendment for it. A bylaw amendment for it. Okay, that's what I think I said. Okay. Wait, you have to put it after the word for. What's that? For it. Oh, sorry. Yep. Okay. And then <clears throat> the next, the paragraph down with the chair introduced. Um, there's a part where it says, Mr. Benson said he likes the idea of extending some of the adjustments to the business district, but he has a problem with going to zero parking minimums, you should say for residential projects. And then a few lines down, there's a word that should be maximum, but it's maximus in here. You were using Latin, which mm. is not allowed. In the Is it maximus or maximums? <laughs> Parking maximums, but not maximus. You see where it um, is? I see maximums. It's up about two. If to on go to the left margin, mm -hmm. go down. There's a word parking, and after oh, I see maximus. it. Yep. And um, that's it. Okay. Any other? All right. We uh, did the, it. <laughs> the maximum that you altered for Gene for Maximus is, should be maximum. Is an, is an M's. Yeah. M's. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, is there a motion to approve the January 25th, 2021 meeting minutes as amended? So moved. Second. All right. Kim? Yes. David? Yes. Dean? Yes. I'm a yes as well. All right. Uh, so now we will uh, move to open forum. I think James is still with us. If anyone would like to uh, speak, James, go ahead. You have three minutes. Please state your name and address. Sorry, trying to figure out all the technical difficulties. No problem. Yeah, I know. Surprising, I'm still here. I had a question about. Oh, sorry. Uh, James Fleming, 58 Oxford Street. I had a question about something I was reading on the um, the website for the ARB. It's um, the the six there are, says there are six ways that a zoning change can be initiated and the first one in the list is called land owner petition and it says that one or more property owners can petition for a zoning change that affects their property i was looking at chapter 40a of the of mass general laws and it says that if you're an individual who owns land that could be affected by property or that um uh, a zoning change that you have the right to propose an amendment what got me thinking, is it possible, say I became a homeowner and I'm in NR2, for example, can I propose an amendment that says I want my property to become an R3, just unilaterally? I'm going to turn that question over to Jenny. <laughs> we, we have had this come up before, so you, you could technically, <laughs> you, you could technically do that. Um, it's happened more in relationship to Property that properties that might straddle districts, you know, so there's like an, you know, you're a single family in a two family zone, but maybe you'd prefer to be an R1 um, or vice versa. Um, so I, I think it usually is that sort of uh, petition. Um, I haven't personally seen this in the time that I've been in Arlington. I don't know if there's a, a strong history or record of uh, people coming forward to petition for uh, a change like this, um, you know, it's something that we would consider. There's a process that you would go through to uh, consider a zoning map change. Uh, that's another kind of consideration, um, but it is possible, yes. Okay, so in a, hypothetically speaking, what are the what would the criteria be for to to decide whether it would get approved or not? Um, like, like say say it's like. I'm in, I'm in a sea of R2 
and it's a it's a I'm, anyway, it would be it would be this lone dot of R three in that C of R two. Is that would that sort of just be shot down on site? I mean, it's hard to it would be hard to evaluate this sort of in a speculative manner without looking at a couple of maybe okay. proposals or ideas, um, which you know we can talk about. Um, I, I would be glad to schedule a time to talk with you about any ideas you might be having or things that you might be considering. That's actually the best way for anybody to start these conversations is to is to talk with our department and potentially others about um, these proposals. Uh, that's usually where we prefer anybody starts. Okay. Um, but it's hard, it would be hard to you know judge what would be appropriate and which criteria we might apply. I mean, you're simply allowed to come forward with such a change, and then it would be evaluated based upon its uh, you know whether or not it is a, is a relevant, uh, I, would, I would say would be the first one, uh, potential impacts to neighbors, to the, um, you know, the district that it's currently in, um, and any other considerations that we might need to take up uh, when evaluating such a change. You know, it's, we wouldn't want to create spot zones, that's the other thing, you know, and sort of the example that you just provided sounds, it sounds a little bit like spot zoning. So I think we'd want to also look at, um, you know, what what is the exact reasoning for creating a district change? Gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Great. Thanks, James. Uh, any other public comments? All right, we'll close it. Uh, so, David, I believe you had something that you wanted to share with the board. Yes. Well, we've lost most of our audience, but. Uh, this is my public notice that I've decided to resign from the ARB effective April 16th. Uh, so that gives us a little bit of extra time if we have any lingering uh, town meeting related business after uh, April 8th. Um, but uh, it's been an interesting and productive four and a half years, but it's time for me to step away. Well, we thank you very much, David, for all of the hard work and um, impact that you've had on the board. I'll certainly really miss you. Yeah, me too. Me too. And, you know, among the millions and zillions of bad things with the pandemic is you're the third person leaving. We haven't had a goodbye party for or anything like that, you know, because uh, you're leaving. And Aaron, probably you too, right? you know, when you go, it's, it's, you know, so yeah, miss you on the board, David. Yes, Thank it's been you. a pleasure working with you, David. Yeah, I, I don't believe it's been four years. Wow, it's time's flying by. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's been, it's been great and a, and a wonderful learning experience for me. Uh, not without its challenges, however. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm sure I'll, I'll see you around town. I'm, un unlike some of the other board members who left, I'm not leaving town. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, any other uh, any other announcements or any other uh, items before we take a motion to adjourn? Okay. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So motion. Second. All right, uh, we'll take a roll call vote to close the meeting. Ken? Yes. David? Yes. Dean? Yes. I am a yes as well. Thank you all for sticking in this evening. Thank Good you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye-bye.